Thank you and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Development Review Board of Tuesday, April 6th. My name is Dawn Philibert. I am the clerk of the board and um, Brian Sullivan, who's on the board and is the um, acting chair is not able to be with us tonight. So um, I'll be chairing the meeting. Um, let me just hold on a second. I'd like to um, introduce the board members tonight and the staff. Um, with us tonight is Mark Baer, uh, myself, Alyssa Eyring, Jim Langan, Stephanie Wyman, and we have and welcome a new board member tonight whose name is Dan Albrecht, and he is with us on the phone. Welcome, Dan. Thanks and very much. In attendance from the city of Burlington, um, is Marla Keene, Development Review Planner, and Delilah Hall, our Zoning Administrator. So with that, we'll jump into the agenda. First agenda item is, are there any additions, deletions, or changes in the order of agenda items? Um, I had posed that if we wanted to, we could move minutes and other business to before six and seven, if you think they'll be quick, but um, if not, we should keep it the way it is. Okay, all right. Um, because Jim is uh, accused from six and seven, that's why I brought that up. Right, shall we Shall we see how the, the evening goes or do you want us to decide that now? Um, no, <laughs> no preference. Okay. Um, why why don't we see how it goes would be my suggestion and um, I'm hoping that this meeting will be done by 10 o'clock tonight. So um, any other additions, deletions or changes in the order of the agenda? Um, this meeting is being recorded. Um, just so you'll know, um, announcements, are there any announcements? Uh, I would just like to re-announce now that a few more people have come on. If you're not on the board or on staff or an applicant that is currently being considered, please mute yourself and keep your camera off. It helps us keep track of who's participating when. Thank you, Marla. Great suggestions. Um, the other thing I want to announce is we're going to try something a little bit different in terms of sign-in tonight. So um, if you are interested, in, and so please bear with us, this is a totally new thing. Um, if you are here to testify or um, speak, provide public comment for agendas items number four, which is for the airport, or number seven, which is for Hickory Hillside, um, that's a better application, or for South Village, um, you can sign in by putting your name and email address in the chat box or sending me an email at mkeene -E at sburl.com, S-B-U-R-L.com. Uh, if you are here for agenda item five, which is for BlackRock Construction, or agenda item six, which is for Allen Long at 1720 and 1730 Spear Street, we are going to try something new. We're going to put a link to a sign-in sheet in the chat box, and you will click on that link and put your information in there. Uh, the board has certain obligations in terms of keeping track of interested persons, and we think that will go a little more cleanly. So we won't do that until that application is open, but we will make it clear, and I'll say it again then. Engineer. Mar Marla, um, it's Dawn. <clears throat> People still need to sign in even though they might not be providing testimony, correct? That way they can be considered a participant. Um, if you may provide testimony, you should sign in. If you don't provide testimony or send a written comment, you are not considered an interested person. Again, I'm going to repeat, somebody is not muted and it's really interfering with our conversation. So uh, please mute your um, microphone by uh, clicking on the green microphone at the bottom of your screen. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
So again, anyone who wishes to participate in the hearing should sign the virtual sign-in sheet. And anyone on the phone who would like to sign in can send an email to Marla um, uh, and provide your email, please. I would ask that you mute your phone or computer so we don't catch the ambient noise in the background. And comments and questions from the public not related to the agenda is our next agenda item. Does anyone have comments or questions not related to the agenda? Hearing none, I think we will go ahead and uh, take up the first item on the agenda. Uh, the first agenda item is a sketch plan application SD2109 of Burlington International Airport to amend a previously approved plan for an airport complex. The amendment consists of constructing an approximately 34,660 gross square feet of two-story addition to the south end of the existing airport terminal at 1200 Airport Drive. Who is here for the applicant? Uh, this is Larry Lackey, Director of Engineering and Environmental Compliance, and I have uh, four other people with me if they could introduce themselves. Sure. Uh, yep, Stu Moncrief here with uh, Jacobs Engineering Group. Okay. Uh, Carolyn Orban from Wagner Hudson Landscape Architecture. Hi, hey, Carolyn. Hello. And Chris Yandel with Engelberth Construction. Okay. And Jackie DeJess from EIV. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone on the board um, have any disclosures to make or need to recuse himself from, from the presentation and participation of this application? Hi, Don, this is Stephanie. I need to recuse myself from this project. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, any others? Okay. Um, so this is a sketch plan uh, application, which is not a formal hearing, it's really an opportunity for the applicant to provide kind of a high level overview of their project, seek some board input um, to help them shape their further application as they move toward preliminary and final plat. Um, we don't swear in witnesses. Um, we do ask for any public comments at the end of the uh, present at, at the end of the boards uh, going through some of the staff comments. So um, at this point, I would uh, like the applicant ask the applicant to provide a, provide us with a fairly brief overview of your project. Um, we have a tight agenda tonight, so if you can just tell us what you have in mind and uh, give us the highlights, we'd appreciate it. So thank you. Okay. This is Larry Lackey again, uh, Director of Engineering here at the airport. Um, we were going to kind of do a, a team presentation, which we'll, we'll make quickly. Um, I'm going to do some introductions and talk about the purpose and need. Uh, Chris from Engelberth will talk about the building. Uh, Stu will talk about the site. Carolyn will talk about the landscaping. And Jackie uh, will give us an update on, on the permitting status uh, because a, a month has passed since we made this application. As you can see from the drawing, uh, this, this big yellow space is off airport circle which is directly off airport drive as you enter into the airport um, it's total total square footage first and second floor has been refined in the last month to 33,440 square feet um delilah or marla whoever's driving can you go to uh, the number two pdf of um um well I wanted to okay we can we can do a quick view if if you're coming down airport you want to go through this marla or would you prefer i, I wanted to kind of give an overview of the larry, larry if you can refer to the pages in the packet i will be able to find it for you okay number it was the number two after the application was number one the presentation was number two all right larry the packet um as opposed to your application so what we sent to you on wednesday of last week has everything compiled into one pdf Okay. Um, okay. Um, hmm. So what is, I think you're probably looking for the plans, right? Yeah. Okay. So we just talked about the location. Keep going down. Yeah. Okay. There. Okay. Stop right there. Okay. So this is coming around airport circle as everybody's aware coming into the airport to do drop offs or parking. Uh, Delilah, are you driving or is Marla driving? I am. Delilah. Okay. 
All right, Delilah, can you just go to the next slide? Okay, um, so basically the long-term plan here, this is from our master plan. As you can see, the two red areas that says to be demolished, that's very long-term. That's the North and South concourse. Um, so, and eventually we will build a long um, airport terminal consistent with typical other airports. The reason for this is, as you can see from the North and South concourses, the little legs, the, this airport was built for small regional jets, 50 to 60 uh, passengers uh, per flight. Um, as time has progressed, uh, the number of flights is reduced, but the number of people going onto airplanes is increased um, where we're getting 100 to 180 seat aircraft, which this airport wasn't uh, built for. So the long-term plan is to get more consistent with a, a typical airport where the um, rather than these legs and airport bridges going off these legs, you'll have one um, uh, terminal where planes will part perpendicular, which will give us a lot more apron area. Um, that said, the purpose of this project is to consolidate our TSA into one location to make it more efficient for um, passengers. As I said, you know, when you're only having to fill 60 seat airplanes at a time, you know, passengers can make their way through uh, our two small TSA locations. However, when the aircraft is bigger and they're all coming through at the same time, you're talking hundreds of passengers all at the same time, very early in the morning. And before the pandemic, we even had times here at Burlington at our small airport where people missed their flights because we couldn't process them fast enough. So we um, no, we realize this as a problem. We access funding for this project. So for for that we propose to to build this first phase um, of the project, uh, which is what we're calling the TIP, the Terminal Integration Project. Um, Delilah, if you don't mind going to the next one, that would be great. Okay. So that's basically the footprint we're going to we're we're going to move forward with. That's two floors, thirty three thousand four hundred forty square feet. Delilah, if you can go one more. Um, so quickly, um, this is just um, on the inside of the building, which I'm, I know you're not um, that concerned about, but should understand. So once you come into ticket, like you always have, you'll ticket, and rather than going left or right in the future, once this is built, you will go right through one TSA location with multiple updated scanning and TSA security points. Um, once you pass through this maze of, of, of um, lines, you'll go through the scanning devices, and then if you're going to hit the South Concourse initially, you'll take a left, come back around and hit the South Concourse just like you would now. If you're going to the North Concourse, you would go straight directly forward. You'll see two escalators, stairs, and elevator, which will take you to the second floor. Delilah, can you go to the next page, please? So this is basically the second floor where people going to the North Concourse will just make their way to the left or to the north um, for the for the North Concourse. Um, so our plan here, which we have secure funding for, is to build this 33,440 30, square foot building. Uh, Delilah, the next one. Okay, so I'm gonna, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Yandel from Engelberth Construction, who's our design build engineer. We, we went out for an RFP and we selected um, the Engelberth for the contract. And he's gonna talk about the building quickly and um, then we'll move on from there. Thank you. Chris. Thank you, Larry. And Marla, if I could have you um, turn back to page 14 of the PDF, we'll start there. As, right there, right, correct. As Larry had said, this building addition shown in brown on the right-hand side of the page is a pass-through building for interior purposes only, and it's for convenience of the passengers once they enter the airport and to streamline TSA processing. Um, in general, it has no front door. Passengers will continue to park in the current facilities and enter and exit through the current main terminal and lobby space, uh, just as you do right now. There are no projections for increased passenger trips as a result of this addition at this time. The existing parking facilities will continue to handle the vehicle storage needs as they are currently um, uh, in existence. The FAA has re previously reviewed the addition shown in brown and provided an initial approval of its size, its shape, its location, orientation, and height. And we've just now submitted about a week ago for final approval 
uh, with updated details such as building and roof corners. They want to know uh, both horizontal and vertical dimensions to the foot, and we have updated them with um, new dimensions, which are still within the box that was previously approved by the FAA. We have met with the fire chief, um, Chief Francis, and reviewed the addition in the context of applicable building and fire codes. You could move to page um, uh, nine, please. So again, when we began the design process in, in this particular arrangement with the airport, the, we are responsible for the design as well. That's why we don't have an architect uh, with us this evening presenting. Uh, the architectural team that we've hired are a combination of uh, national and international airport um, specialists and also local architects to help us with the local design code. The placement of the building when we started design was um, was um, was um, developed relative to the entry drive approaching from airport um, parkway, as you see. Airport drive. F4 drive. And and it fits how it fits within the curved road and the established vegetation already in place. If you move to slide or page number 12. Let's start meeting. The the existing building, we, we are queuing on the existing airport building. That is the theme of this project, is to queue in on the uh, building uh, aesthetics and theme that have already been um, well proportioned and, and developed over years of project renovations and additions at the airport. And you'll notice in the existing construction, there are, there are vertical elements and there are horizontal window elements. And so that's what we've brought forward into this building. It's as you approach and get onto Airport Circle, we felt it was, it was necessary to continue this theme from the existing building into the addition. The airport's master plan, as Larry had mentioned, uh, this building is the basis for that continued master plan. So we felt we wanted to maintain the existing relationships of the old building and, and into the new. And if you, if you um, turn to, uh, I think it's page, uh, four, let's see, further down, please, uh, down. It's the, it's the second to the last, that one right there. Number 17, please, I'm sorry. So this is the theme that we are projecting of the addition. And as you can see, it maintains the horizontal relationship and theme of windows from the existing building. And it carries through in the vertical elements with the pilasters that were uh, developed uh, and are very evident on the existing building. There's a lot of glass on the upstairs. The TSA directive on the first floor, which is where those screening elements are, um, ask that the glass be minimized for a safety and security purposes. The materials on the building are also consistent with the existing construction. They are uh, metal panels, and we've actually added and continued with the sunshade theme that um, was from the existing building. There is vegetation uh, around the building, which Carolyn will also talk about uh, uh, in, in a little bit. But um, Stu, that concludes my explanation of the building itself, the building design itself. Okay, thank you, Chris. And again, uh, Stu Moncrief here with Jacobs Engineering Group. And uh, Delilah, if I could have you go to slide number 20. Okay, I'm just gonna discuss the site layout and this is really fairly simple. Um, and I'm just gonna discuss this one slide, so I'll be brief. Um, the uh, the rectangular shape that you can see shaded in in light gray, that is the ex the proposed building footprint that matches up with the south face of the existing terminal building. Uh, as Larry mentioned, sixteen thousand seven hundred and twenty square feet on each level, um, and it's all within the existing airport fence, so it's on the secure side. And as a result, um, the existing work area, as shown with that dark dashed line around the perimeter 
Uh, everything within that line is currently impervious area. It's all paved. So we're not adding any new impervious area as part of the project. Um, so that uh, um, diagonally hatched line towards the bottom of the improvement area, that is area that's currently paved and that will be returned to um, landscaped area as part of the project. And Carolyn will discuss that in just a moment. Uh, so as part of the site improvements, we do need to reroute some drainage and sewer line around the southeast corner of the proposed building. Uh, that's the top right part of the building as you see it on this plan. Uh, so that will be rerouted around the building footprint. Uh, water and um, uh, electrical will come into the building from the west side uh, from that uh, service road that's off airport circle there. And uh, gas and communications will come from the existing terminal building. There will be no new services for those. Um, so the exit, the, um, the work area proposed is about 35,000 uh, square feet uh, of disturbance area. And like I said, uh, that landscape area there um, uh, to the, to the west of the building is uh, about 6,500 square feet that we're returning uh, from impervious to, to a landscape area. So, um, relatively simple uh, in terms of the site plan overall, and uh, uh, happy to answer any questions you might have later. But uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn Orban uh, from Wagner Hodgson to discuss the uh, proposed landscaping. Okay, uh, I don't I don't know what slide it is, but it's a it's a just the only landscape drawing in there. It's a hand drawn color it's plan. It, thank you. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Um, so the concept behind the landscape design is a theme we introduced while putting together the airport landscape master plan. And, and that is the idea of emulating the look of a Vermont native birch grove in the forest. To reinforce that concept, um, we're proposing groupings of birch trees along the existing entry drive uh, within the planted islands. Uh, this is also meant to visually lead one through the drive and to the main entry. To further this concept, several additional birch are planned to be added to the front of the addition to highlight the facade. Now, those actually aren't shown on this plan at this time. That's something that we've added recently. Um, but you can see sort of a yellowish green area in front of the building. And that's where the, um, I think, two more birch are going to be added. Um, to reinforce the birch theme, um, and in a move to, be more, to do something more abstract and sculptural, um, we're proposing a series of white light columns in heights ranging from 10 feet to 16 feet interspersed along the front of the building. And then bands of low ornamental grasses will form the ground plane and soften the base of the sculpture. Um, these fixtures, some of which are lit and some which are not, um, th those that are lit are all full cut off and fully shielded. Um, and then in order to respond to the architectural treatment of the facade, uh, linear bands of decorative gravel will be planted with tall ornamental grasses and centered on the building's architectural fins um, that we were just talking about a few minutes ago and those will run from the building to the curb um, we're enlarging the existing dumpster enclosure and a and uh, in order to accommodate the existing dumpster that's currently located along the service drive um, the existing fencing, which now runs um, on the east side of the service drive, will be rerouted away from the front of the building and will go around uh, to the back of the dumpster and then connect into the end of the addition. And this leaves that nice grassy area that you can see in the drawing um, where we have planted um, honey locust trees. Uh, in addition, we are screening the dumpster with some native um, plant material. And we're also doing some screening around the existing transformers that are in the planted islands. Uh, our preliminary cost estimate indicates that we will have a significant amount of funds for the gateway project. And I think that's all, unless you have questions. Um, Jackie, if you could give an update on the permit status of where we are with all the permits. Sure, I'll give a quick overview of key permits. Um, we have submitted our Act 250 permit application. Um, that was on March 22nd. We also submitted our individual construction stormwater permit with the state. We have a pre-application meeting for our operational stormwater permit with ANR later this week. And um, we'll be submitting our site plan application to the city after we have that meeting with ANR. We also have a drafted fire and safety application. 
Um, and I did want to note that we've updated our adjoining property owner spreadsheet, and um, you'll see that with our next submission. I would also add a, a draft Act 250 permit has been issued with the public notice. So, um, so that's our presentation. If you wanted to move to staff comments or whatever you'd like to do, um, Don, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Or ask any, answer any questions at this time or go through comments, whatever you want. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to shut my window because the F-35s are flying overhead. Yeah, they're closer to me. <laughs> okay. Um, so let us proceed through the staff report comments. And um, so let me just open my line on the iPad here. Okay. Hmm. Um, First comment, staff recommends the board ask the applicant to describe what the role, what role this building addition will play in terms of the appearance of the site and exterior of access and circulation. Seems like we've heard some of that in your presentation, but um, board, do you think we need to hear more? No, I think that presentation I thought covered that basic concept. Is that you, Mark? Yes. Sorry okay, thanks. Uh, any other board members? Marla, do you, do you have anything to add? No, nope, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it looks good to get this level. This is enough detail. Good, okay. Uh, on to the second comment. Uh, the building is proposed to be 36 feet high. Allowable height for a principal building in the airport district is 35 feet. Staff recommends the board ask the applicant how the proposed height will compare to the height of the existing terminal and the adjacent parking garage. Chris, do you want to handle that? I, I will. I'll take that. Chris Yandow from Mangoberth Construction. Currently, the FAA, or previously, the FAA approved a vertical height of 37 feet above the ground. Uh, we believe that that value was consistent with the existing building. Um, we are currently evaluating uh, looking internally at floor to floor heights and um, ensuring that we stay relatively close to that value. Uh, we do not intend to be any higher than the existing building. Uh, those large uh, pilaster uh, elements in the front of the existing building um, are what we're trying to mimic uh, in form and shape, but not necessarily height. So uh, again, we're not trying to have this addition be the monument for the airport. It's just a continuation of the previously um, uh, designed themes. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions from the board or staff? I have a quick question. Go ahead, Mark. Here. Um, the the rendering you have, which is slide 17, the one that shows the um, you know the exterior of the building with the fins and the horizontal glass, you know, it, it looks like it's the perspective of it is the inner sort of road, um, like the inner circulation road from actual airport drive. You know, the actual road, the circulation road in the airport. How prominent is this going to be, or is it going to feel like it's sort of set back behind, you know, the the landscaping plan and behind another road? Um, so I can add a little bit, and then maybe Caroline can add. Basically, this is the inner circle. This is off air, airport um, circle, um, and um, it will be, you know, the existing landscaping in front of this area will be maintained along with the additions that Carolyn represented, and also. The, the area now that is currently um, uh, impermeable um, will now become uh, an area in front of this building landscape as described by Carolyn. So I have a question. I'm not sure I understand that. So this road on which we see those three vehicles mm -hmm. is existing road or a new road? No, it's it's existing. If you want to go to a, the site plan, we can show you that. Or, or, or the landscaping plan, whichever one. Yeah, just go to the landscaping plan. 
as you yeah, can it, it's actually an existing service road it's not the road that uh takes you past the front of the terminal building um it's it's basically utilized for for deliveries for um for the trash truck that's accessing that dumpster enclosure to the right there um but it's not uh, uh how you would actually approach the airport from oh. airport side Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. I You're think seeing it's a the building visually, visually without the landscaping that Carolyn has shown. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little deceiving because it looks like the it looks like the service road is running parallel to the building when it really is not, and so it doesn't look like there's a lot of space there for landscaping, but there's more than there that are there appears to be. I, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I don't have the concern with it. I'm just saying, right now, it's hard to visualize what it's going to how it's going to be perceived as an addition to the airport when you're coming in on the airport circle drive. I think it's going to be fairly well um, sort of veiled in, in uh, tree, tree branches and it's not going to be a straight shot, I guess is what I'm trying to say. There's, there's a lot of existing trees that are already there and then we're adding quite a bit more. Right. So I think it's going to, it's going to feel quite integrated. Okay. The slide, if I may, the slide on page nine will give you a, a feel for how the new building sits behind the vegetation. Yeah. That would be good to see. Thanks. So the, the orange circle was our attempt to place you visually as to where the addition is going behind exactly behind that existing vegetation. And 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 we are proposing even more vegetation on this right hand side median. So uh, to go back to the previous slide where there's a road, the road Carolyn spoke of, when people enter the airport, they're not going to be confused about what road to take. Not at all. It's already there and they don't use it. OK, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from board members um, about number three? Oh, I'm sorry, I guess that was number two. So I guess so we're just, ready to- I Just have a quick question about that height. So is that the desire to stay close to 37 to mimic the other building, but on the other hand, we're over the 35. So does the board customarily grant waivers for this kind of thing? Yeah, so the board has granted a number of height waivers for the airport PUD. Um, generally, it's evaluated on a building by building basis. There's no blanket waiver. Um, but historically, okay. the board has been comfortable with things that are consistent in appearance and well integrated to things that, are, that the new buildings are proposed adjacent to. Um, what I Chris or Larry of the parking garage at the end if it's nearest this proposed addition. Uh, it, it, it is it is much less than that. I mean that parking garage at the south end only has the two levels. Um, I, I don't know the exact number. Maybe that's something you could address in a future application. So noted. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, number three, staff recommends the board ask the applicant to describe how they believe the above three criteria are met. Staff recommends the board consider the relationship to the existing terminal and the existing parking garage when providing feedback on this criterion. Applicant, uh, what, do you have thoughts about this? Chris is ready for this. Yep, we do. Again, Chris Yandel with Engelberth Construction. We spent a lot of time with the airport when we were first brought on board in terms of um, looking at the master plan, deciding um, what the elements we were going to um, match or meet, and felt very um, felt very strongly that the existing airport is such a, a theme that's already been developed over the years that felt as this addition in order to make it look as though it, it, it is not a separate addition or a, or a separate entity in, in, in the, that was just planned there, we felt we really wanted to carry through these strong elements of, of 
you know, vertical pilasters and horizontal windows, which you see in this theme here. We, we, did, we did continue also with the sunscreen elements. Again, because this, the, most of this glazing that you see on the addition is west facing, we felt uh, equally important that we wanted to continue those sunscreen elements. Um, from a strong massing standpoint, the existing airport, because of the pedestrian um, um, uh, program that, that has to be met for, um, again, bringing folks in and out of the existing main entry doors, there was the green canopies that were built into the, uh, the original airport. We don't have those here because we certainly don't want the public thinking that this is an entryway. So we focused um, mainly on the, the building, the lay of the land. That's why the service road was not changed. We wanted to tuck it and keep it in the back, keep it behind the vegetation, and then continue with those same elements from the existing building out into this one. Thank you. Questions, comments from the board? Ready to move on? Number four, staff comment number four. Staff recommends the board have a frank discussion with the applicant about whether the approved overall landscaping plan remains a workable solution to landscaping at the airport. Um, this is Larry uh, Lackey, I'll address that. Um, we feel strongly, as you know, uh, we became before the board a, a year or so or more ago and spent months and weeks um, getting that master plan approved. Um, we did submit uh, several weeks ago uh, a plan of the first phase of that, what we're calling the gateway, which is off Wilson Road, which the board asked us to start on first. However, um, when I submitted it, and I'm, I'm, I'll take full responsibility for this, my computer didn't tell me it didn't go through. Um, however, and I didn't call Marla or Delilah for a couple of weeks after that, and uh, you know we were busy with everything else. And um, lo and behold, we found out when we got this comment um, that it was never received from from the city of South Burlington. So it's my, you know, I typically follow up with Marla and Delilah when I submit things. Um, the the phase one of this, which include the gateway project, the first phase off Wilson Road, includes enough um, costs to include what we had committed to with regard to the hotel, their their commitment to what they had to pay, the addition of the cost that we can't provide landscaping here directly on the site in that and a little bit more. So we have, we have submitted that. Um, I did get that straight out with uh, Delilah and Marla. They do have that now and we'll proceed forward with that. Do you have any Thank questions? Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board or staff about that? Is that frank <laughs> enough? Is that frank enough? A discuss? Is that an enough of a frank discussion, Marla? Yeah. The purpose, you know, the airport has great opportunity with the overall landscaping plan. Um, no other PUD in the city has this kind of plan to sort of pre-approve some landscaping. Um, and, you know, it just kind of, it's felt like there's been four applications that have used it. Um, and so I look forward to seeing it actually taken advantage of with this application. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to it too, because it really adds to the whole area, um, you know, um, from um, Wilson Road all the way back to Airport Parkway. So, as you know, because you reviewed it. <laughs> so. Um, that, okay. That, <laughs> Thank you. I am having trouble seeing the top of this document. I think that's the last um, comment, isn't it, Marla? It is, yeah. So um, we can entertain additional discussion from the board, and if there is none, um, we can take public comment. Public comment, sure. Okay, board um, members, any comments or discussion you'd like to have about this? Um, Don, I'll just weigh in on this. I think that the project itself, you know, um, it's a nice little addition project. I mean, it's not a small addition, but for what the airport provides, it seems as though it's a, it's a needed addition. Um, mm -hmm. It does not seem to be like it's going to be intrusive. Um, right. It's not going to affect traffic. It's not going to affect parking. It's not going to affect circulation. Um, seems to be, you know, they've decided it's a good location for it. 
the design of it seems to be well, you know, thought out and sensitive to the actual airport with good landscaping that sort of make it sort of fall into the wayside you know, scenes and sort of I, I don't see any issues with it, you know, at the sketch plan level. Well, those are great comments from an architect, Mark. Thank you for those. Other comments from the board? Hearing none, I'd like to entertain any public comments about this project. Um, how, let me see. Um, do we in the chat box Marla and Delilah know how many people want. We didn't ask them to register. So, All right. So, if you'd like to make a comment, please either say your name or write your name in the chat box, um, or just say, I would like to make a comment, and we will um, entertain everyone in turn. Anyone want to start off with a public comment? Okay. So, if there's no public, um, does the board need anything else from the applicant, or can we can we see them at preliminary plan? I'm kind of feeling like that makes sense to move to preliminary plan. I think we've heard some good testimony and and address the issues that you've identified. Board, does anyone object to that? Okay. So do we? Well, we don't vote, do we, Marla? We just conclude the hearing. Yeah, we'll see you at preliminary. Okay, thank you for um, your presentation and good luck with your application. See you next thank time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Okay, moving on to um, agenda item number five, <coughs> continued final plat application SD 2106 of Black Rock Construction for the 6.91 acre Wheeler Park Wheeler parcel phase of a previous previously approved master plan for a 450 acre golf course and a 354 unit residential development. The planned unit development consists of establishing three lots for the purpose of constructing a public road, 22 dwelling units in two family homes and 10 units in single family homes at 550 Park Road. Who is here for the applicant? Benjamin Avery from Black Rock Construction. And with me tonight, I have Brian Courier and Paul O'Leary from O'Leary Burke Civil Associates. And we also have Joseph Happy from Maine Drilling and Blasting. Okay, thank you. Um, any recusals or um, disclosures before we um, start to review the staff comments. Hi, Don. This is Stephanie. I need to recuse from this one. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Nope. And um, Ben, I believe you've probably all been sworn in except um, Joseph, the, the drill expert from Maine. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, what is your last name, Joseph? Yeah, hi. Um, also with me, I have our supervisor, Pat Paquette. Um, he can speak more of the technical terms to blasting, whereas I'll uh, go through the uh, project on the engineering side and management. Uh, my last name is Happy, H-A-P-P-Y, like the mood. Great, great, uh, great last name. Would you both please raise your right hand and swear that the um, information you're providing to the board tonight is um, is true and um, under penalty of perjury. Yes. Okay. I heard one yes. I need to hear two yeses. And I, I need you both to say yes. Uh, Joseph. Yeah, you are. Pat Paulcat. Yes. Did you say yes? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I feel like we've had the board's had a lot of testimony about this project. So I'm not sure that um, we need an overview of the project. This is 
the continued final plat application, which is kind of the final phase before the board deliberates and makes the decision. Um, no guarantee that it will conclude tonight. We'll see how it goes. But um, I guess before we start going through the comments, I wonder, Ben, do you have any anything you'd like to say about the project that's in addition to what we've already heard of what you've said? No, I think that um, you know, really, this this uh, hearing is just about uh, supplemental information that's been provided and um, follow up. Uh, if the board is okay with it, and staff is okay with it. Um, uh, Main drilling has been very gracious to uh, make time for us tonight. So, if it's uh, if it works for you folks, I'd love to give them the opportunity to go through the blast plan because. Uh, that's sort of uh, the one new item tonight, and uh, everything else is uh, follow-up and supplemental information, mostly on design. So um, following main drilling and blasting, then Brian Courier and I can go through those supplemental materials. Okay. So um, you're suggesting we start with the blasting testimony. That is correct. Okay. So just for um, to remind the board and to give um, the public public participants and overview, we had a very full staff report that we have gone through and we um, have some items remaining in that staff report that we didn't get to at a previous meeting. Um, but in addition to that, we have a memo uh, from Marla that kind of highlights some of the issues um, that we've already reviewed. So. If the board, unless anyone on the board has an objection, I would suggest we move right to the uh, blasting issue, because that seems to be a significant issue um, mm -hmm. that we need and more. And just to clarify, we'll go back to the other issues, right? Pardon me? We'll go back to the other issues. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Madam uh, Chair? Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, just, just for the record, I do know uh, Mr. Avery from uh, a project through work at Chittenden County Regional Planning. Um, we, we do run a brownfields program that helps hire scientists to assist in redevelopment of properties. And um, Mr. Avery did approach our brownfields program and our brownfields advisory committee a, a few years ago, and uh, they're wrapping up a project and we pay CAS engineering to help with a redevelopment of a parcel in Essex Junction. And that project's wrapping up here, I think in the next month or two, as far as uh, a commitment and stuff. So. Okay. I I appreciate your um, disclosure. Do you feel that in any way your former relationship or ongoing relationship, it sounds like, with uh, Ben Avery would um, in any way bias you and your professional opinion? Um, no, not at all. I mean, this is a, a small town, so I'm familiar with the engineering firms, the development community. Of um, course. So it's just kind of the way it is, but just for the record, I want that to be known. Okay. So please talk to us about the blasting plan. Mr. Happy? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, we were hired by BlackRock to uh, provide a drilling service to identify the rock surface um, for his project, uh, which we have provided. I don't know if you guys are versed with the, uh, with the project, but um, we have shaded uh, areas on the um, Google overlay uh, where rock is to be removed to get to design elevation um, for buildings, utilities, roadway, and such. Um, our blast plan, uh, main drilling and blasting is a very uh, safe, reputable company throughout the Northeast and uh, you know down South. Um, we take pride in safety and um, this blast plan really represents um, what we do for the project and how we progress through, um, you know, start to finish. Um, I don't know if you guys have a blast plan in front of you or where you'd like to go with that. Marla, is it helpful to bring up the, um, uh, the plan that was submitted with the original packet? that shows the uh, shaded red areas. Is that not in this packet, Ben? I don't uh, I don't see anything that looks like that in this packet. 
Oh, shoot. Well, I'm very sorry. Um, yeah, I can pull that up. I'll just be a second. All right, but, I'm going to stop sharing then. Okay. Um, ben, we last heard you on April or March 3rd, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and you would have had a copy of both the main drilling and blasting blast plan as well as that illustration. And then I think the only supplemental material was uh, you requested a letter stating that they would um, be complying with all of the uh, city ordinances. So the only supplemental you got was the letter. Um, okay. I'm not sure the date of that, but it would have been in the last several weeks. Okay. I'm just reading through pages of architectural visions, working my way towards the blasting plan. Um, well, she's looking for that. I think that, um, as I recall, some of the issues that the board and the public have raised in relation to blasting is the noise and um, safety issues. That helps at all. So I have the, this is the blasting plan from the last pocket, and I can zoom in a little bit here. Um, so the portions of the regulations that blasting um, are, oh goodness, very difficult to share and look at other things at the same time, um, are in the last couple pages of the staff comments um, and they pertain to, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Well, I don't know how Delilah does this. I'm just curious. Um, okay, so they pertain to, oh my gosh. All right, um, the extent of ledge removal, um, methodology of removal, mitigation measures. Specifically, um, if there is um, anything that relates to our performance standards, which are about um, noise and vibration, we need information on the proposed machinery, operations, and products, um, amount and nature of materials to be used, mechanisms and techniques to be used, method of delivery and disposal or recycling of any hazardous elements and uh, other information that's necessary. Um, we also need to provide um, conditions pertaining to warning systems, monitoring reporting, um, and then handling of materials, storage location and hours of operation. So anything you can testify to further those um, submission requirements or help us write those conditions um, is what we're kind of looking for here. And that's all that stuff that I read is on page 16 of this week's packet. Um, okay, so um, that was a lot of information. I don't have page 16, um, but I can certainly uh, run through um, question by question and give you answers. Would that okay. work for you? Sure. Do you want me to start at the beginning then? No, yeah. I'll email you uh, the packet as well. You, you, okay. Um, so the first information is a description of proposed machinery, operations, and products. Okay. Yeah. So we, we'll be using um, a T30 track drill. Um, these are uh, self-contained uh, drills with air compressors on them built on, so no trailers or anything. Um, they are on tracks and basically they utilize um, a hammer to vertically drill uh, holes in the ground um, to a specified diameter uh, in order for us to fracture the rock properly to, uh, to be able to dig it. Okay, so you're drilling holes that you're going to then use as like a pilot hole for blasting. Correct, we will drill holes in a series um, in a pattern per se, like on a six by six pattern. Um, we will put holes wherever needs to, uh, blasting is needed. Um, okay. So, amount and nature of materials to be used. Um, and we, you keep in mind that none of us are experts. So, to the degree you can dumb it down to a high school level, that would be great. Yep, 10 4. Um, so on a daily basis, we will bring to the job site 
explosives in self-contained um, certified containers on pickup trucks. Uh, we will load the drill holes with explosives, fill the top portion of them with uh, a stemming stone material, which um, allows the explosive blast horizontally and not vertically, uh, up like a shotgun barrel. Um, this will vary on a day-to-day -day basis, the amount of poundage that we will utilize per shot. Um, anything, any of our mater explosive material that is left over on a given day will be brought off site back to our uh, magazine sites in, uh, in New Haven, Vermont. Can anyone hear me? Um, if you're not participating in this part of the meeting, if you're not on the board or an applicant, um, we're, we're going to take public comment there, okay? Um, so the next one is um, mechanisms and techniques to be used in restricting the emission of any hazardous and objectionable elements, as well as projected or actual emission levels. So emission levels in this case could be noise or vibration. Okay, so all of our um, all of our drills we're running are all um, uh, emission certified. They all run the DEF uh, DEF system, which is an additive to the diesel for the clean uh, fuel emissions. Um, that's standard now, company wide. Um, Where did? As far as that, I'm sorry. Uh, just heard someone talking. As far as um, environmental um all of our explosives will are um non-soluble to water so when we put those uh in our load in our drill holes um they are packaged emulsion and uh and don't dissolve in water which um creates um a, a really good efficiency for blasting in us in a wet area um once these explosives are detonated uh they are no longer um you know, explosives, they fracture the rock and uh, dissipate. Thank you. And method of delivery and disposal or recycling of any hazardous chemicals. Again, all the explosives will be brought to the job site on a daily basis in a certified um, container uh, on our pickup trucks and or trailer um we will what we put in the grounds for explosives will be detonated before we leave the site any unused explosives will be returned to the magazine site off-site from the project uh, in our certified containers storage units um as far as environmental hazards uh there, there will be none Ask an off slightly off book question because I think that this is um, sort of an interest to the board and board. If I'm way off base here, just shut me up. Sure. Um, is there any chance you will use a method other than blasting? For the magnitude of the project, uh, the duration would be astronomical. So is that a no? <laughs> uh, I'm going to refer to Ben on this. Marla, are you asking if they're going to chip the rock? Um, well, that's one thing. I don't know what other methods are available. Maybe digging if it's like rotten or something. Rotten, rot. Um, I, 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 I think if, uh, if if the question is sort of in the interest of the public who have had a lot of commentary on a nearby project where they chipped it, um, uh, I think Joe's answer, and correct me if I'm wrong, was given the magnitude of uh, the rock that needs to come out, that would be incredibly inefficient, which is why they are here to blast. And to clarify, um, uh, main drilling and blasting is not in the ledge chipping business. They're a blasting organization, so uh, we have retained them to manage uh, the, the rock removal on this site via a blasting method. Um, so we have not retained them and nowhere in their scope is any sort of uh, chipping of ledge. So this is Dawn. Um, on, your, uh, on the aerial 
photograph or drawing, um, there are pink areas, dark, very dark pink, and you know, very light pink areas. What? Explain to me, please. Kind of give me the key because I can't seem to see it on the screen. Yeah, sure. give me one second. I'm just the, scrolling through our. Um, yeah, just scroll through our blast plane here on my bigger screen. So what we've identified here is um, the circle uh, around the perimeter is the uh, industry standard 250 foot uh, pre-blast radius um, on the outside of the blast zone. The lighter pink um, shaded areas are the shallower depth rock to be removed, um, generally in the three to five foot range. The darker shaded um, areas are the deeper rock, which were will be in your five to 10, 12 foot um, range. So when I say 10 to 12 feet, uh, we would be drilling 10 to 12 feet in the, in the earth to blast 10 to 12 feet of rock out to achieve the design grades for the, um, you know, the structures and the utilities. Um, so the lighter shade, again, is the shallower rock. The deeper shade is where your deeper rock concentration is for the project. Um, in this scope, we've highlighted these utilities. Blue is the water line, green is the sewer, and orange is the storm drain. Uh, these utilities will have to be blasted uh, in order to get to the invert of these uh, pipes to, um, so they can be installed for the project per spec. Thank you, that was very helpful. Um, board, what other questions do you have about blasting? Safety, noise, whatever. Or Marla? I, I guess Oops. one question, John, this is Marla. Um, in terms of blast protection for adjacent properties and neighboring communities, um, you know, what type of I want to say, I guess I want to say guaranteed do you have that this won't be affecting you know the adjacent properties and neighboring communities when you do do the blast yeah it's a good question um so each blast that we do is uh is is designed um in a software and verified through our company um that to ensure that the blast will the amount of explosives we use per blast will fracture the rock and um, contain the blast in the blast zone. Uh, we will utilize blasting mats on this project due to proximity of the uh, existing uh, town roads. Uh, so we blasting mats are a rubber tire. Um, uh, it's a rubber tire mat. They're 12 feet wide by 24 feet long. That will be placed on each of our blasts. In most cases, we will double mat this and that just um, goes on top of the ground, on top of our blast holes after they're loaded. And when we detonate the blast, it contains uh, debris from flying and uh, really puts weight on the ground to uh, fracture the rock properly for the construction of this project. Okay. And then the follow-up question to that, how long, you know, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with blasting to know how large of a scope this project is and how many blasts and how long and how many a day. I mean, what's what's sort of the timetable? And this is coming from, you know, the project for last summer, which was chip, you know, chipping and we were told, you know, a month and then it was two months and it ended up feeling like it was all summer long, all day long. Um, you know, I'm wondering if you, do you, do, you know, can you give a schedule and hours of operation, timing, you know, anything like that? Yes, the hours of operation um, will be to the uh, to the specs, South Burlington specs, which in this case I believe are 8 a.m. without looking at our blast plan or the specs right now, but 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, generally speaking, we will do two smaller blasts per day um, on different parts of the uh, project. Uh, so yes, two two blasts per day is what we're aiming for in this in this case. As far as duration, um, I don't have that in front of me, uh, Ben. Um, I can look it up if, if that's important right now. It is. Okay. Um, 
I don't have that in front of me either, but we can certainly get an answer pretty quickly. And then from a impact standpoint, from like a noise nuisance ordinance standpoint, let's just say, you know, how close could you, or how far away would you be and not hear or even notice that a blasting is occurring? So a typical blast is, is no more than uh, what we refer to uh, for the public is a thunderstorm. Um, it's it's millisecond shot. Um, you know when we detonate that blast, it, it's uh, literally like one one uh, thunder clap, and um, you know you're gonna feel the air the air waves, um, not not at a far distance, but it's very very contained, very well designed, and it's uh, not your typical um, like Western style blasting, you know. Nowadays, everything's just uh, very strict, and yeah. we have uh, strict rules that we had to abide to um, both state and federally. Okay, but like, you know, I see your blast radius red line around the property sort of touches the, the driveways of the development across the Dorset. You know, will the people in those homes hear or feel it each time you do a blast? Um, again, they'll feel like airwaves, which is no more than, uh, you know, a thunderstorm or whatnot, but it's, um, all right, so let's go back. Uh, when we do these blasts, we use seismograph and, um, and megaphones that monitor ground vibrations and um, airwaves. Um, anything within any, uh, any structure, whether it's inside the blast zone or outside the blast zone, we have to abide to state and federal reg regulations, which for an air blast is 133 decibels. Uh, I know it's a lot of terms for you guys, but, and for um, uh, ground vibrations, it's two inches per second at any structure within the, within the project or um, the next closest to the project. All of our standards that we do in Maine, we will be uh, within standards and we will stay under the two inches per second and we will stay within the 133 uh, decibels air blast. These are all studies that have been done uh, from ancient history. Two inches per second um, is at your old school um, plaster foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, studies have been done to show that at two inches per second, you will not get hairline fractures or uh, anything of such. So. These standards are very strict, um, and we, you know, all of our blasts will be designed to stay within criteria at the closest structure to uh, to where we're blasting. Okay. I guess I am, would like to get the information as to the schedule of blasting, how long this is, the duration this is going to go on for. Well, I think that just just jumping back in, Mark, I, you know. Two things. First of all, let's just call a spade a spade. We're talking about comparing this to long drive and making those kinds of estimations is exactly what got us in trouble there. So I'm not particularly interested in us or any of our subcontractors representing that it's going to take exactly 21 and a half days to do this project. And not only that, but the the reality is having worked with these guys on a blasting project last year in Williston, um, the, the, the blasting really, those two blasts a day are only one piece of it, uh, because it, as they work through the project, um, they do a blast and then there's, there's an excavator on site that's doing what's called blast support. And that excavator's job is to remove the blasted material, um, so that they can continue the work zone. And there's all kinds of logistics involved with, um, the rock that's on site and moving stuff around and making sure these guys can continue to work. So, you know, it's very, very difficult to say um, that it's going to take a specific amount of time because it's not as simple as them saying, oh, there's going to be, you know, 20 charges and we do two charges a day. So it's done in 10 days. Um, it, it's just more complicated than that. And, 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 you know, um, I think if there's anybody from staff on the call, uh, I don't think that 
city staff wants to deal with the calls that they dealt with last summer where we gave some sort of a time frame that was not helpful to anyone not to us not to staff um, it, it just it, it creates an expectation and the reality is um, these things are under the ground and you know we do our best to you know these guys have a ton of technology they can tell you what rock is there but just the the physical time to remove it and the, the variety of activities going on by multiple subcontractors is just very hard to gauge. I hear what you're saying, Ben. I'd actually be more comfortable with Joe just given his general knowledge and experience saying historically a project this size might take a month or something like that where we're not getting into specific time frames. Joe, do you think you could sort of uh, with the caveat that it is a total ballpark, can you ballpark something for us? Yes, Ben. I, um, a project of this nature um, would take um, um, one to two months to complete. When I say that, um, our duration is in days, not including weekends. And I think you're right there in the month time frame. Adding in weekends, I believe you're around the one to two month period. And that's blasting every day. Every day that's warranted, right? Um, we have to deal with weather, um, you know, weather breakdown, stuff like that. But we aim to blast every day, yes, uh, to be productive. Um, in a real world, it doesn't happen every day, but that's going to be our goal. What kind of weather would um, interfere? Uh, depending on when the project goes, if it snows. Right. Um, oh. If it's uh, you know raining, we drill in the rain. We um, typically won't blast in the rain. So um, things like that. Drills are very they're pounding rock every day. Uh, they break down often. Um, so we'll have days that we'll have um, you know uh, some sort of delay to our to our business. Um, but it's something we're we're equipped with. Thank you. I I got a weigh in on this a little more um you know mr happy i'm i, I obviously main drilling and excavation highly reputable company i'm sure you, this is you've got this down to as as much of an exact science as you can given that it's underground you know legend stuff i'm just pretty concerned to hear one to two months you know two blasts a day and then you got your support mechanisms going on which is not rock chipping, but it's not quiet either, you know, hauling the rock, dumping, throwing it into the, you know, the dump trucks, which is going to be the banging and rattling, you know, for one to two months with no guarantees, it sounds like it's trading and chipping for blasting and rock removal, but on a similar type scale to long drive this past summer, which I guarantee you that the staff getting the calls is nothing compared to the neighbors living it during the height of a pandemic when you're trying to have your windows open and enjoy the outside and it's just this incessant pounding so those types of unknowns i'm going to need a little more information in terms of some you know technical information in terms of the audible decibel you know so i look to the bring it back to the regulations a little bit the board has some authorities in this um and i think that you know it sounds like there may be some interest in exercising some of this authority um the board i'm going to share my screen again it's probably easier than just reading it so this is from the packet um and the board has the ability to impose conditions on the following um and this is you know the storage handling, hours of operation. I think the real operative one here is hours of operation. Um, warning systems, so that would include, you know, notification of neighbors, notification of the city. Um, and I would love to hear from the applicant, you know, how, what, what you think is appropriate. And then the board is obviously going to um, consider what, what they think would be appropriate. And then um, the other ones are, you know, monitoring and reporting. What would you guys be doing? Um, what does the board want? And then are there any other restrictions? And then the only other thing I want to remind the board is that of the ability to invoke technical review. Um, you know, I love that we're getting all this information, but if at any point we feel like we're out of our depth, um, we can get technical review of the testimony. I would still like to hear it, 
in a public session so that you know we can get technical or viewability information. So Marla, it's Dawn here. My question would be, what what is um, if they come forward with information, and if we were to invoke technical review, um, what are the alternatives for them if it turns out that it's excessively noisy or the duration is too long? I mean, there's rock, they want to do some building. What would be alternatives? Or would that essentially kill the project? No, I think that would be um, something we would be looking for the technical review to recommend. So okay. I have contracted, I've contacted um, a technical reviewer and they've said that they can, um, you know, help work with us. You know, they may come back and say, wow, major lane blasting has really done the best you possibly could. Um, and that's going to be the recommendation that the technical reviewer would provide to the board. Or they may come back and say, you know, we think they missed a thing or two here or there and we think we can tighten it up a little bit. You know, in these areas, and then it's up to the board whether to implement that recommendation. So, would um, would now be the time for the board to vote on? I don't know if it needs to vote, but indicate whether it wants to invoke technical review, or would um, would it be more appropriate when they come back with specific information to do that? I would suggest um, asking and if they would like to provide more written information on these um, potential conditions and what you would be comfortable with, or if you would rather provide it verbally now, and then we can kind of proceed with you. Um, with technical review, there is the opportunity for a little bit of discussion on the provided materials. So it's not like it's not like the technical reviewer is working in a vacuum. They they take on the role of staff and they can have conversations with the applicant while they're doing their review. So the next sure. the next step would be for the applicant to provide us with a written written information about what they testified on tonight with more detail. I I, I think what would make sense is we can ask main drilling and blasting to uh you know to provide some you know written follow-up to this discussion tonight for staff to review um you know this is with these situations um i'm i'm oftentimes a fan of a technical review simply because most of what main drilling and blasting is talking about is over my head um and is you know most likely over everybody's head so they're trying to disseminate technical information that we're interpreting as lay people and and that um can be uh challenging and so what i don't want to do is beleaguer this process and talk circles for two meetings about something that really none of us um have a deep understanding of so um, I would agree with Marla that um, given uh, my experience um, uh, working with this company, um, I, I can't imagine that a technical review would turn up anything um, earth moving, excuse the pun. Um, so we would, uh, we would certainly be open to that. You, you know, all I would say is that um, you know, much as with the traffic study that was done on this project, um, which we were very comfortable having done uh, because we were confident in its outcome, uh, this sort of falls in the same category. I'm not overly concerned with it. So um, certainly if technical review is gonna make staff feel better and in turn make the board feel better, um, we're, we're open to that and, and I'd be open to expediting that process. Dan, did you have a question? Well, I would just, curious if the city has had a database of where blasting has been done before and and mostly from the standpoint of establishing a track record of of what historically blasting experiences sound like so that when these issues come up now or when they come up for a different application there's a understanding among staff and DRB and the general public of 
what blasting entails. I think it's new to a lot of it. It's new to me, but, um, but that's all. I, if I'm, I'm perfectly fine with moving forward to technical review and, and uh, it's Greek to me as well too. So I think a third party look at it would be great. So Lila, did you raise your hand? I, I, I don't, I just uh, briefly to speak to Dan's point, we don't have a database per se, but the most recent project that incorporated some blasting um, in the Southeast Quadrant was um, the construction of Midland Avenue in South Village. That was about a year ago. So okay. I guess I would like to know if the board would like to um, go forward with what Ben has proposed, which is um provide some additional written testimony on specific criteria in the staff report and then we'll go ahead and have that reviewed um by a third party technical reviewer i think and that sounds like a great plan yeah. other members i uh, agree yeah me, me too okay jim okay good so, so it sounds Marla, like we need to make a motion to invoke technical review correct Yep. So I'll make a motion that we invoke technical review for the purposes of reviewing the blasting plan. Thank you, Mark. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Thank you, Alyssa. Okay, so we've heard the motion. All board members, um, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. So it sounds like it's a go, Marla. Okay, great. I can get that started tomorrow. Um, that is going to require we continue the hearing and we can talk about that later, but I would suggest um, May, May 6th, I guess. May 4th. Okay. Okay, so shall we move on to um, non blasting stuff? And Yes, I'm just looking for the memo here. Um, Shall we go back to the memo and work our way through it? I think so. The memo is organized a little bit differently than usual in that um, some of the previous staff comments are lumped together. So the first thing in the memo talks about staff, old staff comment number one and two pertaining to pre-construction grade and height. Um, Don, do you want me to read it since I've got it open? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to find it. I want to make sure. Go ahead, Marla. That would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. So the first staff comment in this week's memo is, since the purpose of the single story area is to avoid an abrupt change in the land and building massing at these high visibility locations, staff recommends the board decline to change the condition of preliminary plot and instead require the applicant to adjust their proposed development plan for these homes, these being the homes in the easternmost single story area, to allow them to meet the condition. Staff considers that this should be done prior to closing the hearing, otherwise the record drawings will not reflect the grading, which facilitates construction of units 17 and 18. So if we show the overall site plan, probably. And Delilah, I promised you links and then I didn't do it, so I apologize. Um, page 17. Actually, maybe even better 19, Brian, if that fits the grading plan, would that be helpful? Uh, why don't you go to 20? It's kind of strangely cut off here. Yeah, it's uh, the site plan's cut into two because the site's uh, a little too big for one. So, so what, what we're talking about, uh, if you want to go to the southern, the the lower plan, Delilah, is uh, unit 17 and 18. We had a, a, a fairly uh, detailed discussion last time we were in um, about pre-construction grade and how heights measured um, in the city of South Burlington. Unit 17 and 18 are in a predetermined zone uh, that require them, them to be single story units. Uh, there was no requirement for height, uh, just that they were single story units and 17 and 18 are being constructed on the low side of the road. 
And because the, the existing grade drops off um, as you move down that hillside, the difference between a uh, the finished floor grade, uh, our desired finished floor grade of the units and the uh, existing pre-construction grade um, left us with about a height of uh, 12 feet for those two units. Um, uh, last time we discussed that we, um, uh, for future homeowners, we desire a positive grade on the driveway. We really don't like setting the uh, garage floors below the road um, unless there's some, um, some sort of agreement between the applicant and the DRB. Um, in our opinion, these units are going to be, um, they're going to look odd and, and frankly, I think they'll look like a mistake if they're set um, with negative grade uh, pitch on their driveways. So uh, I went through and established the pre-construction grade elevations for the two units and a desired garage floor elevation. And as they've been proposed uh, to you today, unit 18 would be 23 feet and unit 17 would be 25 and a half. Um, feet. Now you uh, allow a required height of 28 feet, um, and the board was uh, was posing a 20 foot requirement um, for the single story units, and, and that was mostly in response to a mezzanine portion of the regulations that we weren't intending on um, pursuing, but was caught by staff at the preliminary stages, um, if my recollection is correct. So. We're, we're really just asking for 23 feet and 25 and a half feet, uh, not the allowed 28 feet. Board? So, Mark, here they are. Important in consideration here is the part that leads up to this staff comment, which sort of explains the background of this standard um, and how it came to exist which I didn't know Paul had to tell me about that. Mark, sure. does your architectural training help in any way with this? No, but possibly. One question I have for you, um, Brian, the yep. rear of 17 and 18, you know, I, I see that it's clearly going to be a walkout, you know, basement. Um, but how, you know, What's the height of the structure on the, the back of those two buildings? Yeah, so as they're graded right now, they're both graded as walkouts um, in the rear. Um, so the height of unit 18 is, is 23 feet, the way that the city uh, measures height, and uh, 17 is 25 and a half. And uh, so when you're when you're standing on on the path, um, you know, you'll see you'll see a sliding door entering the basement, and then you'll see the uh, you know the ground floor um, above it. But from the street, um, as all the single-story units being constructed with a proposed roadway, um, you'll see the single-story unit um, that's required in, in the district. And I I just like to reiterate that we're we're not asking for any waivers. Um, we're strictly uh, asking for um, you know, the board to um, allow us to build to um, well less than the required height uh, in that zone. And we're still keeping it a single story unit. The, the, the biggest issue for us is, is putting a negative slope on the driveway. You know, those, both those units are located at the bottom of, of the loop. Um, you know, a negative slope on the driveway um, you know, is definitely not ideal uh, for a new, uh, new homeowner. Uh, for either one of those units. Yeah, but then the only thing you end up with is a trench strain sort of along the, the width of the driveway, you know, in front of the garage, correct? Yes, it, it's it's still not an ideal practice. I mean, the, the land is still sloping towards the house. Right. We, we try at all costs to stay away from a situation like that. So what would be the alternative? Uh, I, I think uh, 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 alternative that was uh, acceptable to the DRB uh, about a month ago was allowing a, uh, us to build to the required height that's allowed in the zone while still keeping them single story units. Do you have elevations of 17 and 18 in the packet? Yep. 
Where would we find those? Hey, Mark, can you really be closer to your microphone? They're pretty hard to hear. Thank you. Where would we find the elevations in the packet? Yeah. They are cherry and spruce. So spruce can be found on page 76 and cherry is 82. And that's essentially what you're going to see from the uh, from the roadway. Yeah, it, it's just it, it's a technical, you know, it's it's South Burlington just measures yeah. height kind of in a in, yeah. a in a different way is yeah. really the the issue here. So right. So the, from from foundation, you know, you're you're talking about it. Front looks like it's about a 15 foot tall building measured to the midpoint of the the roof plane. Correct. Yep. But when you when you take into average grade around the perimeter of the house, Correct. that bumps up to twenty three feet. Yes. Yep. Right. Twenty three so and twenty five and a half for the one right. next to it. Yep. So all the single story units on the high side of the road on the upper part of the plateau, we don't have this issue with, but essentially they'll look the same from the road. And those won't have walkout basements. Correct. Those will be this grade around the perimeter. Likely, I think the duplexes might be a garden style, you know, four foot window in the back, but essentially they'll look the same from the road. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm generally okay with it, you know, but I guess my concern is that the fact that it's so close to the road in the back and you have you grade up to the, the the back slider and then you're you know going up essentially two stories on the back of the building i'm just concerned about how it's going to be perceived from the bottom of the hill as you drive up the hill and you see these how how well screened are they from a vegetation standpoint so on these the eastern side of the units uh, the site plans uh, do east i think I don't know. Yeah, on on the on the eastern side of the of the units is the uh, the 27 foot type one uh, required by the NRN zoning, you know, screening buffer, and the the grade on the rec path mark is 390, yeah. and what I got on the back of that unit is 393. Okay. So it's not it's not way up there. Yeah. And what is a definition of a type one whatever berm? Oh, it's it's uh it's a very Not long <laughs> it's a very long rigorous uh, table. Yeah. What is going to actually what is what is it going to achieve? It's it's designed for screening purposes. It, okay. It's specifically proposed along both uh, the areas where the project abuts the rec path, so it goes. It starts from behind units 17 and 18, actually yeah. curls around where the where the sediment four bay is and wraps all the way along along the project and yeah, uh, all the way up on the extended Dorset Street. Okay. Yeah. So Brian, this is the this is the dense narrow firm. Yes. Uh, it's a type two. Type two. Type two, is that what you said? Yeah, type two, 27 feet wide. I believe there's a uh, type one. Used for creation type path, 20, 27 feet wide. Yeah, so it's 27 yeah. feet wide and has certain like limits. Yeah, so uh, specific amount. Yeah, it requires required. a certain amount of shrubs, trees. Uh, it, it's very specific on you know density of plantings. There must be this many you know trees within this distance. And um, yes, it's it's a very um, specific. Uh, screening buffer okay so it says that the combination of shrubbery has to occupy at least 50 percent of the area at the time of planting all of which shall be distributed through the minimum buffer width yep and, and i believe our landscaping plan has exactly how we're implementing that buffer uh, 
think to Mark's point, um, you know, the language that's excerpted from the settlement agreement talks about the appearance um, of the transition from this neighborhood to the adjoining natural area. And I think that what you guys are talking about right now really gets to um, the core of this question. Is it, it's, the question is, does it meet the settlement agreement with these heights, and with the screening and um, the elevations relative to the rec path? Do we have the language from the settlement agreement in the packet anywhere? Yes, it's immediately preceding the red comment in blue. Okay. Two. Okay. So the blue paragraph in top of page two. And that includes site design standards that require compatibility with adjacent natural areas. Anything else about this issue before we move on? I guess, I guess the since if I the board is going to say you have to make them 20 feet high, they need to go back to, and redesign them. Um, so it'd be good to get some feedback from other board members on where we are on this question. Well, I think if I can jump in, I, I, I think the concept of um, and Mark can certainly weigh in. The concept of, of chopping five feet off that roof line, um, unless we're going to build flat roof, you know, houses is, um, uh, you know, is, is not ideal. So um, I think the alternative answer would likely be to sink those houses and have an inverted driveway. Um, I think just to Brian's point, um, that's not ideal and and uh, it is going to look a little wonky as you come down the street. So, uh, you know, really, I think that some of, uh, I could see the argument both ways. We could talk about what is the visual impact to the bike path and what is the visual impact to the streetscape because they, um, you know, they're both affected by, or one or the other is affected by what we do here. Yeah, Don, I'm going to just leave it with this, that, you know, there's a specific reason for the settlement agreement language. And I'm not talking about flattening the roof or anything, but I, I do think that we, we really, I'm personally leaning towards requiring it to meet the 20 foot, which means if you need to depress it slightly, there's a reason that this area of the site has got that requirement. And it's so that you know, maybe it might feel a little wonky to you as the developer, but I think from a site design for this purpose and why this was done this way, to me, so seems appropriate if that's what you need to do to be able to get two more units into the um, the development. Or you don't um, do those two units is the other right. option. If that's what, if you want those two units, you're going to have to meet the intent, which might be depressing the the slabs a little bit so that you can meet the twenty foot. I do agree that it's on story, but once you factor in that it's elevated up and you got a major walkout on the basement, on the back of it, the house feels like it's lifted out of the air. So it doesn't meet the intent of what they're looking for for this corner of the site. Understood. We we can uh, we can sink them down there. And I'm just one board member. I'd like to see if you know. Obviously, Don's running the meeting. You know, make sure that we're in agreement on that. Yeah, I'd love to hear other people's opinion. Dan, Jim, Alyssa, others? Anyone, anyone? <laughs> Ferris Bueller's day off. Um, uh, no comments, I guess. Marla, what, uh, what should we do with this? Yes, I mean, it's 
I would really like to provide some feedback to the applicant. Um, if the board is unwilling to weigh in on this at this time, I guess um, we'll just have to do that. Either they'll have to read between the lines and make the decision for themselves, or um, you know, you guys vote in a deliberative session to share some additional information. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I did get a note from Alyssa who said she's having connectivity issues. What? Um, Alyssa is having connectivity issues. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I feel like we need to do a time check. It's quarter of nine. Um, we still have a lot to go through for this application. And um, we have some other, um, at least one other significant, um, actually two agenda items to get through and then a third one that's not hopefully going to take that long. But I'm feeling like we need to perhaps conclude this hearing, not close it, but conclude it and pick it up another time. What board members, what do you think about that? I guess one question I'd have if we're planning on going that route, because obviously in my mind, um, the architectural is, is a major component. The elevations of the, the buildings that still need, looks like they still need some work to be done on them. And then the technical review from the blasting standpoint is a major element in my mind. Um, right. You know, if we're continuing it, I want to make sure we're continuing it and be productive at the next meeting, um, not just sort of pick it back up where we left off. I'd like to be able to get some additional information incorporated into these as we move on and keep well, going. To echo, to echo what Mark's saying, um, you know, uh, obviously we're anticipating some additional design comments. And if we don't know what those comments are tonight, then we're simply kicking the can to a May meeting and then to a June meeting. Um, so, I, you know, I think the other items can probably be talked through and those might be conditional uh, items, but, um, uh, you know, I do, I agree with Mark. If, if there is specific back and forth on, on design issues, um, spending a few minutes now would be helpful. Okay, let's do can that. Can I suggest we skip directly to staff comment number 15? So the applicant has um, provided a draft condition that they suggest would, so we at the, pre at the previous hearing talked about um, allowing the administrative officer some flexibility and accepting designs that don't exactly match what the applicant has submitted. Um, and the board said, why don't you write that and then come back with, it, come back with that proposed condition. So they have written that. Um, Delilah, that's on page seven, if you can pull it up um, and then, you know, anyone can zoom in using the zoom button on the side of their screen. Um, they provided that draft condition and what they would like is to um, have the ability to modify the exterior colors, the siding, the trim, um, the roof slope, the porches and decks, the window placement and foundation type. Um, staff comment here is, well, if you're modifying all of those things, um, what good are the elevations you have provided? And so we have proposed an alternative, it's not just an open-ended question. And the alternative is to um, do something similar to what other projects in the SEQ have done. Um, I know Rye has done this, Cider Mill has done this, um, South Village has done this with providing a um, design requirements document that says something like, um, you know, no two adjacent homes shall be identical. In order to be considered not identical, they should vary in three of these seven ways. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, is that is that a way the board thinks that this elevation appearance issue could be resolved, kind of creating a palette to choose from? This is Dawn. I'm I think that's an excellent idea. I, I think that it's no, it's not going to come as a shock to the applicant that we're still really not happy with um, the elevations we're seeing, and there is some monotony, and um, especially the single-family homes are not very interesting. And I think that would be a good place to start create 
uh, to create some of the thinking around how to have enough, how to, how to incorporate unity and variability at the same time. And what are the elements of that and what's the guidance around that? So that's my thought. I, I think that my concern there is that we have had challenges with staff in the past on items that have ambiguity or require a lot of subjective thinking and things can get hung up perpetually. And so it is our desire to, even if this takes us the next eight meetings to hammer this out with the board, um, simply because uh, the, the, the way it works um, with the zoning administrator approval is things can get hung up perpetually. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pitch something to one person who's trying to interpret their view of how the zoning is written and then, and then the actual outcome, if we don't agree, is I wind up back at the DRB. And so what we don't want to happen is some sort of a process where I'm winding up back at the DRB with every other house in order to litigate this exact same issue. And so, you know, I think there's value in hammering that out now. I think, I think Brian's, um, Brian's summation of a condition here is a good one because it doesn't close the door. If, if, if somebody wants to come and do a different roof line, um, uh, you know, or change a porch or a deck, um, first of all, that would add additional variety to the neighborhood based on West's design. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but it also gives us a guideline to work from. It's very easy for the zoning administrator to say, no, this proposed item does not meet the regs. So your choices are, build what was approved or don't build anything. Um, but in a situation where it's left open-ended, then we wind up in a situation where there is no fallback, there is no alternative. So if we can't all get along, then we wind up back in front of the DRB on a house-by-house -house basis. And that just doesn't seem to be an efficient way to uh, manage the process. John, can I weigh in on this? Please. Go ahead. All right. Um, I, I agree with you, Ben, and I agree with, you know, staff's position. I think that, you know, there's certainly, we've certainly done other projects where we've had given the zoning administrator the flexibility, but there has to be clear direction and guidance in that flexibility. Um, you know, and, you know, doing a design review requirement guideline or document that gives you the flexibility to, I would, in, I would call it from my standpoint, a kit of parts, a pattern language or a kit of parts for the residential design. You know, you sort of present an, an options of, you know, a typical porch column, one or two typical porch column designs, you know, what type of pitch roof you're looking to do, you're like no more than, no less than 512, no more than 812, something where, you know, you wanna give the zoning administrator the flexibility, but if some of you come in with a, you know, 12, 12 roof pitch, it looks totally out of place, but it hasn't been pre-approved. You don't want to come back to the DRB for that, but we also, you know, should have some guidance as to what's been reviewed and approved. So I would say that, you know, if you present to us, you know, one or two acceptable elevations with a bunch of different options that you can mix and match throughout for these elevations, that type of document gives Delilah the flexibility to review them, you the flexibility to address market conditions for individual buyers, and us the control over what we would expect to see out there when all is said and done. Well, and I think that uh, what I'm saying is that I'm comfortable with being having my feet held to the fire to build what is approved as a part of this DRB process. So. Uh, what I'm looking for is a fallback. So if, 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 if all else fails, I can build this. Um, and, and what you do is present each building in the site, in the development and say, I'm building this one here, this one here, this one here, this one here. And, and, and that's exactly what we've provided okay. literally lot by lot. And, and so, 
a lot more work done on those designs as Don pointed out and you've heard our feedback. Well, I, you know, this is the problem uh, with, and, and, and this is the challenge, Mark. Um, and, and, you know, it's not effective for us to keep cycling 18 different designs and bring them back each time. I would rather have, and I'm fine if the board feels comfortable with Mark giving me specific marked up feedback, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that feedback. Um, this then is would not... it help if we shared um, design guidelines from at least three other developments that are currently pulling permits right now and usually don't run into snags when they issue their permits because they have that kit of parts that Mark is talking about? Well, uh, the, Lila, do we have the authority to do that, to share those documents? They're public? They're public documents. They're part of the decisions with those with those particular projects approvals. Okay, thank you. Well, we can, Madam, Madam Chair. We can certainly take a look at that. Um, obviously, this particular zoning district has its own uh, specific set of rules. But we're happy to do that. What I would really very much appreciate is written feedback from the board. And again, it could be Mark as a designee of the board, but it is very, very difficult. We could be here for months of you folks putting up with me if I'm simply forced to redraw these things again and again and again and again and again. Um, I, I've, I've run into this with other boards. I am not um, an inflexible person. I would much rather have you tell me specifics that you would like to see. Uh, you'll note that in my resubmittal, somebody said they wanted screen porches, they're screen porches. Um, I don't have a problem doing that, but what I can't do is uh, ad nauseum just guess at what I think the board might want. Um, frankly, in this market, um, I could sell anything. So let's get some, so if we can get some solid feedback to us with specifics, I'm happy to modify the designs in a manner that is in keeping with what the board would, would like to see, just Thank in you. the interest of efficiency. Well, Thank we're you. not interested in having you sell anything. We want uh, to I'm see sure. Hello? We want to Please. see design. Excuse me. We want to see designs that um, we believe contribute aesthetically to the neighborhood and um, and are somewhat unique. So. Well, and I, f I feel like we're providing that. And if the board is in disagreement, then I'm welcome. I'm, I'm welcoming the feedback. Um, I don't. I don't see what the issue is with us getting specific feedback. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. I'm sorry, who, who's, who's speaking, it's, please? It's Dan Albrecht, board member. Oh, Dan, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm familiar with the, the design guideline concept, and maybe at the end, uh, as, it, as the progress, as the project's ready to move forward, they will they can provide that template or the palette but i think the applicant's pretty clear and again i'm new to this i did read the minutes from the prior meetings um it seems that the the board wants to provide exact clarity and so i what i'm hearing the applicant saying is the applicant wants that so you tell him we will tell him exactly what it what should be built and fits the aesthetic and other concerns that the board has. So let's take the time to tell it exactly. And if it means marking up the elevations and people drawing on them, I don't have the expertise for that. Um, giving it to the applicant and then, and then, then away we go. I, I think the applicant's clearly demonstrating that he wants that exact feedback. So let's let's give it to him and we can either live with it or not, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So um, I'd like to take a pause here. We're approaching uh, nine o'clock, um, and I, I, I need Marla's input and the board's input. Um, 
we still have several agenda items. Should we just keep going on this one until we get through the comments? We need to make a decision about how to proceed with board input for this project. Um, but we have two other projects to review tonight. So what are your thoughts about how we should proceed? This is really a procedural question and I'm kind of new at this. So Marla, what, what thoughts do you have? Um, I would suggest that we continue this item. I know there's a lot of people in the public who have attended the meeting and listened to the feedback from the applicant and from the board. Um, hopefully that's been helpful to you. Um, I think that we are probably unable to make time for public comment tonight. That does not mean that we are closed to public comment. Um, we will make, especially in the situations where we have no time for public comment at hearing, we will make an extra special point to leave time for public comment at the continued hearing. And as always, written public comment is always encouraged um, if you're unable to attend. So I would encourage um, the board to continue the meeting to May 4th. Um, the board has reviewed all of the public comments that have been submitted up until noon today. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I should have confirmed with you an email that it has been shared, but if I did not, please be assured that every email that hit my desk before noon today has been shared with the board. Um, view those, and if you have additional comments on things you have heard tonight, um, please feel free to submit those in writing or provide testimony at the continued hearing. Um, so unless anyone has anyone on the board has any objections, I would suggest continuing to May 4th. So stopping this now and proceeding with the agenda? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, does anyone on the board have any objection to that? I should say Alyssa had, um, is still having connection issues, so she... Had to jump off. Signing back in. Okay. Uh, uh, excuse me, Don. This is John Bosage. Can I just chime in one, one thing before I time off here? Because... A lot of us have been here for two hours, so we're not going to give any comment tonight. If that's what I'm understanding, we can submit things to Marla and they will get our comments either in writing or emails for the May 4th meeting. Is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing people say? Yes, it is. And um, I, I hope that um, people who are interested in providing public comments have been somewhat enlightened tonight by some of the comments and maybe that's clarified some issues um but this is going to be an ongoing process i know you've sat through a lot of testimony um, sometimes that just happens and thank you for your interest yeah we understand that and and we know you got a busy agenda and so I, i'm very appreciative of that and i know i speak for others would you ever consider having just a meeting on this one topic where we could just talk to you about the issues because there's a lot of people here and we don't want to take up time with the may 4th agenda and because maybe a half hour's worth of comments would it be worthy to have just a meeting where we can speak to you on this just on this issue as as opposed to taking time on an agenda that's a procedural question so i'm going to ask marla to address it please yeah john thanks for asking that question i think it's a great one um from time to time we do have a special meeting when um projects are taking up a lot of time yeah. right now we are pretty up. So I don't think that that's necessary, but I think that if we find ourselves um, slipping and, you know, struggling to get things on the agenda, we will definitely start talking about a special meeting in addition to the May 4th. And it would be um, after so that you would get ample notice. Um, okay. I think that's a great thing to consider, but I don't think we're there right now. Okay. That, I just wanted to plant that seed and the possibility. Yeah, I think uh, that's that, great my guess is there there's going to be that need at some point so thank you very much for keeping that online appreciate it and thank you dawn for your work and the board thank for you. listening thank you okay thank you okay so do we need to vote to continue this yes okay so i would entertain a motion to continue final plat application sd 2106 to may 6th or to Sorry, May 4th. May 4th, sorry. <laughs> sorry, um, did I just make a motion or did I say I'd entertain a motion? You are entertaining a motion. Okay. I'll make a motion that we continue agenda S or 
SD 2105 uh, to May 6th? May 4th. May 4th. May 4th. Oh, do I hear a second? I'll second for discussion. Um, Thank you. John, can we just have some further discussion before we vote on that? In sure. Addition? Sure. So, I've heard a lot of back and forth about the issue of providing some design guidance feedback on the individual designs. Um, yeah, it sounds like that would fall to me to provide that, no pressure or anything. I'm happy to do that, but I don't want it to come from me. I'd rather work something up, give it to the board and staff to take a look at, and then we provide it to the applicant as a board document, because you know, clearly I shouldn't be the designer on this, but I'm happy to provide feedback on the individual units just on things that you know I would I've criticized and commented on and that I'd like to see some some work done on but it should come from the board to the applicant Mark that's very kind of you but what is that that sounds like a huge amount of work or or is this something that would be fairly simple for you to draft up I'll just send the bill to the client <laughs> right I, I can, it's not going to be like me doing drawing and drafting. I'm just going right. to sort of do a little document. This, this unit, I think this needs to be looked at. This isn't working. Possibly add this type of thing, you know, and just go by unit by unit. Um, I'll try to get it to staff and the board, you know, well in advance of the next meeting so that okay. anyone can take a look at it and offer feedback before we pass it on to the applicant. Does that sound like something that we could do, Marla, from a procedural standpoint? Yes, I'm uncomfortable, but yes. Yeah, I know. I I I, I hear what you're saying. Normally, you're we uncomfortable just say, because it feels like we're designing for the applicant. Yes, but at the same time, if the board is taking such a keen interest in the specifics of a design, down to where the windows are and what the porch railings look like, I, I mean, there's an infinite number of combinations I could put together. So in theory, I could be here in perpetuity submitting, and, and it's, it's, it's actually compounded by the fact that there are so many different designs. So in other projects that I can think of in South Burlington, uh, for instance, on Golf Course Road, where you, know, you have rows and rows of identical housing um, that is, less than a thousand feet from this project, um, that's pretty easy to get figured out because you're just building 80 of the same thing. Yep. This is compounded by the fact that I think there's like 14 designs here. So, so the, the, the combinations are endless. So rather than me just hunt and peck in the dark, I would really appreciate Mark's doodles, which really is all I'm looking for. Um, to and, and it's not to say that Mark's going to do a drawing and I'm going to build it, but I think if he marks it up a little bit, then that's going to give us an idea of the direction that the board is looking to see. And that may be the key, not for us to do exactly what he says, but to say, okay, here's what they'd like to see. Here's what they think is a good idea. I can then modify our designs based on those notes. Does that make sense? It does make sense, and I, I I understand your position. You, if you know what you want, tell me so I can I can please you, kind of thing. Um, um, so I would just say, you know, we hear you, Ben, and you know, I need to make sure the board behaves in a manner um, authorized by state law, and so yep. we will take your request in consideration and strive for a balanced approach. Perfect. Okay. Are we Thank ready? You. Just a quick, quick question, and, and we're doing this to the May meeting because um, because the mid-April meeting is already pretty full. Is that why? So revised materials have to be on my desk two weeks before the next meeting, the meeting that it will be heard on. So that's today. Okay, gotcha. All right. Great question. So are we ready to vote? All in favor of the motion to continue the hearing until May 4th, say aye. 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 
Chair votes aye. Uh, opposed? Aye. So the motion is carried. And um, Mark, oh, I guess, Marla, you'll get back to Mark and we'll, we'll communicate about this. And um, applicant, we will see you in May. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you for your patience with us. No problem. Thank you. We're all trying to make it better. Yes. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. So, Marla, we have two, we have three more agenda items. Shall we just proceed ahead or set some time limits for each of the ones still remaining? Um, I think you should set some time limits. Um, Hickory Hillside. Item number seven should be relatively brief. Okay. Uh, and then minutes and other business um, should also be relatively brief. I would probably save half an hour for those two together. Um, I don't know if you want to extend our soft 10 o'clock timeline to something like 1015, or if you want to just go for 20 minutes on the next one. I'm willing to extend it to 1015 at the very latest. Does anyone have any objection to that? No. So that gives us just a little bit over an hour. So I'm, why don't we do, ooh, that's right. Why don't we do um, a half hour on um, Alan Long's project and then move on to the rest of the agenda items. Make sense? Sounds good. Okay. All right. So the next item is um, and i know people have probably been on the phone a long time listening to tonight i'm sorry this is getting so late so the next item is sketch plan application sd 2110 of alan long uh, for a plan unit development on two existing 39.2 acre lots each developed with a single family home just one the plan unit two. development consists of 40 million homes including five perpetually affordable units, 9.3 acres of open space proposed yeah. to be dedicated to the city of South Burlington, 720 and 730 Spear Street. So again, I would like to um, remind people that if you're not on the board and you're not part of the applicant team applying, please mute your microphone um, so that we don't get feedback that interferes with the discussion. So this is a sketch plan. Um, as I said earlier, it's kind of a high level overview of a proposal and um, and we will we don't need to take uh, swear the applicant in, um, but we will learn and give feedback on this proposal. So who is here for the applicant, please? Uh, my name is Alan Long, and I'm here on behalf of my family, which includes my two sisters and my brother and three spouses. My brother Dan and his wife Denise are here tonight. Uh, they can unmute and uh, or at least turn on their cameras. Uh, my wife Carol is here, but she's going to be in a supporting role, so you may not see her. Okay. Thank you. Um, are you the one who's going to be doing the presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you. Oh, um, I should also mention, I'm sorry, uh, Brian Courier, who's here from uh, O'Leary Burke, is our civil engineering contact and has been largely responsible for the sketch plan that you'll see in a minute. Uh, he is here also, and we appreciate his participation. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, does anyone have any disclosures or any reason to recuse themselves? Uh, yes, John, this is uh, Jim Langen. Um, yes. I'm going to be recusing myself from consideration of this application. Okay, thank you. Um, we actually never did talk about whether we wanted to move the other items up. I'm sorry about that, but we'll just move on. All right. So, so, so Don, I'm I'll, I'll uh, I'm going to log off the the conversation. But if I'm needed later, just somebody can shoot me a text. Okay, Jim. Thanks. Sorry, we forgot to, or I forgot to those items. No worries. 
right. Take care, Jim. Okay. Um, Alan Long, would you please give us an overview of your project? Sure. So uh, the the blue that you're looking at here is the combination of two plots of land that are owned by our family. We're planning on combining them for the purposes of this development, which consists of 49 units on 39.2 acres. Uh, Brian took a look at the acreage that we're planning to develop versus the acreage that we're planning to conserve. It's about 10 acres to develop and about 29 that we'll be conserving. A lot of that is, um, is an NRP area that was designated in 2006. It's the, the right-hand portion that you can see of the blue there. Uh, and you can see also that the, the left-hand or westernmost portion is sandwiched between South Point to the north and South Village to the south. So this is a, we feel as if we've designed a, a tasteful infill development that's going to uh, fit nicely between those two existing developments. In fact, the city specified at the time that they approved those developments, uh, a stub road uh, from each of them going south from South Point and north from South Village and our development, our project proposes to join those two stubs. So there would be a road connecting those two developments. And that uh, you can see on this plan here, uh, we're looking forward to ensuring that our infill development respects the kind of look and feel of both of those existing developments because they're, they're gonna be kind of tightly spaced neighborhoods and we want to integrate nicely into into what exists already so as i said the the large uh, eastern portion of this um, proposal is going to be conserved as you may know this uh, this uh, property was one of the ones identified by the interim zoning open space committee as being a very high priority for conservation because that easternmost portion is part of the Great Swamp, which was their number one priority. So we are excited to be able to participate in the conservation of that swath of, of um, forest and open meadow that uh, includes a, um, the western, por the eastern portion of South Village, the eastern portion of South Point, and also the Underhill, Underwood property that the, the city purchased a few years ago. Uh, we're proposing an easement to allow public access to that uh, easternmost portion of our property, and we have some paths that we've uh, proposed that we can talk about to uh, uh, facilitate that access. Um, so, uh, I just say one other thing that we've um, decided to apply during interim zoning, and of course that means that the city council is going to have to to approve this uh, project. Also, um, to that end, we've spent a considerable amount of time sitting in on the planning commission meetings over the last year, at which they've deliberated on <clears throat> the new. Uh, changes to the land development regulations. And uh, as part of that participation, I think we've come to understand uh, that what we're proposing here is in compliance with everything that we know about the proposed new regulations. So uh, we'll, I'll be glad to entertain questions about that. Uh, we've got maps that show uh, habitat blocks and things like that. And uh, in fact, there's there's one little uh, block you can see a kind of a square in the middle of of our proposal here. It's labeled. Uh, it's part of the uh, preserved area labeled B. It's the little square right near that that road connection that I just mentioned. Um, 
that's an uh, existing copse that's been there for for ever since we bought the property back in 1951. Um, almost all the rest of this property was just fields, but that was a nice little copse of trees, and we're looking forward to continuing to conserve that. Uh, even though, uh, as our uh, as we understand it at the moment, the uh, Planning Commission's extent of the habitat block that comes out of the Great Swamp only extends as far as that connecting road between South Point and South Village. So uh, you can see we've got 39 uh, units proposed here. It's a traditional neighborhood development PUD. There are uh, a mixture of building types. We have carriage houses, duplexes, single families, and four uh, fourplexes. We've cited these fourplexes kind of just across the property boundary from the uh, the twelveplex buildings in South Village. We thought that was an appropriate place to put them. And uh, I think I'll I'll just stop there uh, and entertain questions if you uh, want to go through the the staff report. Um, or anything else before that. Thank you, Mr. Long, for that nice overview. So with that, I think we should just proceed with the comments and um, see how far we can get. Um, the first comment, staff recommends the board ask the applicant to describe how the affordable units will meet the distribution standards of 18 Point zero two d So uh, I checked this out with Brian yesterday. Uh, as far as we understand it, this 18.02 section uh, requires that if you're going to include affordable units in a development that you spread those units across uh, a diversity of building types. And that's what we plan to do. We have a couple of we're proposing a couple of the multi-family units be affordable, a couple of the duplex units be affordable, and one of the um, carriage houses be affordable for a total of, of five affordable units. Thank you. Board questions? Marla, do you have any questions? I hear nothing. I guess that helps us. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Don. I was muted. I just said it sounds like they're on the right track. It sounds like what? They're on the right track. Okay, good. Thank you. Any other comments? Board members? No. Okay. So the next comment, number two, is Staff recommends the board ask the applicant to describe their vision for each of the open spaces, including what the conceptual trails will look like and how they will be accessed, and what, if any, amenities would be included in Area C, and that the board provide feedback at this time. Staff further recommends the applicant discuss the NRP lands to be dedicated to the city with the Recreation and Park Committee. Mr. Long, or, or um, do you have any comments to make about this? Uh, sure, I can. I can say a few things. Uh, it, Marla, would it be possible to put up that sketch plan again so that we can all take a look at those three areas? Okay, great. So. Uh, the three green uh, hatched areas in the sketch plan are the ones that are referred to in that question from the in the staff report. Um, that's C there. B is this long skinny one in the middle, and A is the one on the right hand or easternmost side. Um, we we don't we hadn't imagined developing uh, in the in the uh, landscaping sense. Um, 
this um, A area at all. It's it's meadow. It used to be meadow. It's maybe have a couple of trees in it now, but uh, we had imagined just leaving that natural. We've sketched in a a, a, a recreation path, a, a hiking trail through there, but that's not cast in stone. I think speaking in general about hiking trails on the property, we we've um, We've always had trails. We we've used them to access the uh, the woods back on the very right hand portion of the the screen here um, for decades. And you know we'd like to continue to let people uh, use the land in that way. Um, but we want to also work with the folks in South Village and South Point and with the city because it would make sense to have, you know, not just a mishmash of, of trails um, in this whole area, but um, something coordinated that lets, um, lets people walk in the back there, uh, maybe not accessing it directly through our developments. Uh, we're not sure some of those, those recreation paths in the developments are, are owned by the condo associations, so they may not be, um, public access, although uh, we could consider an easement that would uh, that would change that. Uh, we do want to be able to let people use that uh, area and get back towards the Great Swamp. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful area and, and really needs to be shared with the general public. Um, section B there, I mentioned the cops is that little uh, rectangle up towards the crest of the ridge there next to that connecting road. Um, the rest of that is a nice opportunity to uh, to have a recreational path along there. Uh, we'd also like to uh, to preserve the the uh, shrubbery and trees that are along there already because that provides a nice um, delineation between our development and South Point. Um, and uh, we'll we've talked to with the um, Natural Resources and Conservation Committee. They're anxious to um, allow animals to share that path. We, we talked about uh, people during the day and animals at night. So that would be uh, a nice opportunity for us to um, respect the, the natural habitats of some of those smaller animals. Um, as far as Section C is concerned, that's really a small area. We we haven't really imagined uh, developing that very much. We could toss in a couple of park benches. We could uh, plant some grass so people could throw a football around. Uh, you know, we, we'd be happy to talk with the parks folks about that too. Thank you. Board, any questions or comments? Okay. Marla, questions? Oh. Okay. Uh, staff comment number three. Staff recommends the board in conjunction with a discussion of open spaces, ask the applicant to consider inclusion of community gardens in further support of this criterion. Mr. Long, what are your thoughts about that? Well, uh, I chatted with Brian about that too. We hadn't really planned uh, to specify any places for for community gardens, but uh, that that B area would make a lot of sense. Actually, you, you know the the recreation path can kind of skirt along the the property boundary there, and there's quite a bit of of square footage there, even acreage that could be used for gardens. And uh, I think that really adds a a nice touch in a a particular particularly in a development where houses are kind of tightly spaced and people don't have a lot of, uh, of yard space of their own to, to use for gardening. Madam Chair? Yes. Just a, just a comment or suggestion for consideration. The people that are gonna need access to community garden space, are they gonna be the people in those duplexes or fourplexes there along the south boundary. They, they don't really have yards. They don't have that sense of privacy. 
I imagine a lot of people on the north side of the development or the other are going to put gardens within whatever the building lot is out their back door. So I have seen this in some other developments or, you know, near, I, I live over by Rice High School and there were some apartment buildings near me and some of the developers have put in some nice raised beds, you know, maybe near the parking, but, you know, they're, people wouldn't have to walk around somebody else's house to go into the garden space. So I don't know if it's feasible to squeeze them there along the south boundary or something like that. Just a suggestion. Thank well, you, Dan. Anyone yeah, else from the board? Mr. Long? Well, I was just going to say we appreciate any suggestions. Obviously, it's kind of tightly spaced there with the need to supply parking for those multiplexes, but uh, we wouldn't want to rule anywhere out. And uh, I think your point is very well taken about people not wanting to have to, <clears throat> to walk a long way to their garden or, or even jump in the car. That doesn't make sense. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next comment. Staff recommends the board direct the applicant to prepare a traffic study for the proposed 49 unit development. What are your thoughts about that? Well, we're we're happy to do that. I think it, it you know we had certainly anticipated that we would need to provide some some input to the city about that. Uh, you know, 49 units isn't the biggest development in the city, but but it's a significant number of of units and uh there there will be a, a small but not negligible impact on the traffic on spear street because of this development certainly so we the board could expect um a traffic study analysis in future presentations yeah we were thinking yeah. about doing that as part of preliminary plat but if you okay. wanted it before that we could do that too no, I'm thinking preliminary plat would be fine um, unless anyone would like to see it sooner. Okay, thank you. Um, staff recommends the board ask the applicant to discuss the trail layout in this area. Well, I already- This comment's mentioned. referring to the NRP area to the east. I'm, so, I'm sorry? So you're thinking about the NRP area uh, on the eastern edge of the, the property, is that my understanding, correct? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we know quite a bit about that property having lived there for, for 70 years now. Um, you know, there's definitely um, a, an incipient stream and some wetlands between the uh, developed portion of this project and well you can see the tight contour lines there there's kind of a bluff there but just to the west of that bluff there's a there's a stream running through there which is pretty wet at certain times of year uh, we certainly don't want to be you know building structures across that that uh, stream but we do want to be able to get people into the woods in the back there uh, so you know we'll be glad to work with uh, any of the city committees that uh, that uh, want to express an opinion about that. It may be, uh, my understanding is that South Point has granted the city an easement to uh, allow hikers to get through the back of their property. Um, we'd be willing to grant a similar easement, but uh, it would be probably more efficient to have people use existing easements maybe even use access um, through the underwood property because it's definitely drier up there and uh, um, but you know we're 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 open to suggestions I, I don't want to rule anything out and I don't want to try to specify anything you know cast anything in stone at this point so Lila, can you flip to page one of the staff comments the overview map when you say the underwood property um i just wanted to show what that means yeah the underwood property 
is just to the north of South Point. So you can't see it on this sketch, but it goes out to Spear Street and it extends across the northern boundary of the South Point development. And then um, there's a, it kind of turns down. Uh, it's, the northern border of the Underwood property is Nolan Farm Road, I believe. And, uh, and it extends down uh, so that it connects with the, with the South Point property. South Point, you know, was under the same kinds of constraints that we are. There's, there's NRP area on the east side of that property. So they, they granted an easement to the city to, um, to allow access to the portion of their land that also um, is contiguous with and forms a portion of the Great Swamp. So in talking about that natural resource protection, I think Delilah is going to show that overview map on page one. Um, seems oh, yeah. to be having a connection too. Um, you know, it's sounding to me, Board, and let me know what you think about this idea. If this is the city city owned property here, oh goodness, my computer is not catching up. Um, and you know, there's a big there's a big swamp in the middle. Mm -hmm. Maybe it makes sense to talk to the Recreation and Parks Committee about, you know, should this just be a connection here? And maybe it doesn't make sense to come through the property. Um, but I think that because the Recreation and Parks Committee has been really working on the Underwood parcel, um, they would be really well positioned to provide that feedback. So and Marla, oh sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna also mention that there's access to the back of the Underwood parcel. I believe there's a city-owned right-of-way uh, where Nolan Far uh, Nolan Farm Road is taking that sweeping right turn on the northeast of what we're looking at right here. I don't believe it's showing up as a tax map, but I believe there is a city-owned right-of-way there uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, generally in that location, but just just another point of access. Yeah, there's so, actually a city. Uh, uh, there's a sign that the city put up, uh, you know, just west of that curve that you just that you just pointed out, um, kind of at the crest of the ridge, kind of near where your green line intersects the top of this this sketch. Uh, hmm. That you know. It would be a perfect place to access the Underwood property and these um, contiguous properties to the south from Nolan Farm Road. And nice and dry up there too. So, board, um, does anybody have any feedback, or do we want to direct them just to work with the Rec and Parks Committee and the Rec and Parks Department and come back with some some um, come back with something? That sounds like a good plan to me. Any other board members have any thoughts about that? No, I, I think that, you know, working with the Parks and Rec Committee to come up with some recommendations. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, next comment. Uh, the applicant is proposing a connection in the vicinity of the South Village Trail Network to the South. Staff recommends the board discuss with the applicant whether it makes sense to connect this trail across the central proposed roadways and into the wooded open space B. So uh, that's a good good thing for us to talk about. Um, we, in, we, included, we included a trail connection there to the trail system in South Village. They call it their quiet path. And uh, we've had some conversations since that sketch plan was drawn up. Uh, I think we have to make a distinction between private paths and public paths. And it, my understanding is that this quiet path in South Village that you can see right along the blue property line there is, a, is, a, is private. It's owned by the South Village Community Association. And it may be that we shouldn't be encouraging people to cross back and forth between these developments on a pathway system like this. 
um, you know, if there aren't easements to the city that would open it up to, you know, public access. Um, as an alternative, uh, it might make sense to, to, to figure out what we're doing parallel to this road connection up on uh, over the crest of the ridge there, uh, the right hand most road that you see on the sketch plan. Uh, there's been talk about a, a, a bike path along there. There's been talk about a parallel uh, hiking path. There's been talk about uh, just a sidewalk. And, you know, we'd, we'd like to do whatever the city decides is best, but coordinating with South Point and South Village, it doesn't make sense for us to put a, a bike, you know, a, a 200 foot bike path there when it doesn't connect to anything in the adjacent developments. Um, so, you know, we'd be glad to work with those community associations and with the city to figure out what's best to do. Thank you. I have a quick question. Yes. So the paths on your property that um, are in the developed area, are those intended to be open to the public as well, or will those be uh, kept private for the association? Uh, we haven't at the moment uh, thought about opening those up to the public, but uh, we're, we're open to suggestions and we want to do what makes the most people happy. Uh, I think it would be kind of disruptive to this little neighborhood that we're proposing to have floods of people walking along um, in people's backyards. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we we really do want to work some kind some kind of access out for the the uh, easternmost portion of the property. Um, another thing that's been discussed is is actually uh, you know public access along the westernmost section of the property. There's talk about uh, you know bike lanes on Spear Street, maybe a separate bike path. Uh, along Spear Street and and again along the lines of what I just said about the 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 other the easternmost end of our development, um, we'd like to do what the city is envisioning um, and what's being done in front of these adjacent properties. Uh, it doesn't make sense to build a bike path just for 600 feet in front of our our development and not have it connect to anything. On the other hand, if the city wants to put in a bike path, you know, all the way up to Swift Street, we'd love to participate in that. So, uh, you know, we're 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 kind of open to to what's going on in the future um, along those lines. Okay, and my, and that question was just posed um, because if it was open to the public, we were talking about connectivity um, to the property to the south there and their recreation path, which is or their quiet path. Um, but I just thought it might be a little confusing to members of the public if they're accessing your property um, and then connecting into the you know private development area. So that I think you answered my question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long, and thank you, Stephanie. So I, given the time, 9.41, I think we need to move on the, to the other items in the agenda and continue this um, uh, sketch hearing, sketch plan hearing. Um, so I would entertain a motion to continue the sketch plan hearing to a date. Marla, what date might we be talking about? This is where it gets tricky. Um, you know, we could put it on May 4th with the one that we previously continued. Um, the only other thing I have committed for that agenda is a relatively short O'Brien amendment. Um, they want to change their phasing. I think it should be quick, I hope. Um, so if we were to do that, I guess we would probably be limiting it to those three items. Do we think that that's a palatable amount of stuff for one night? Is that manageable? You mean, do you, do, are you asking if we think it's too much or not enough? 
I guess I'm asking if you think it's too much to put this and the one that we just continued, um, the five park road on the same agenda again on May 4th. What do other members of the board think? Mark, you're a seasoned board member. Um, I think it's fine. I mean, we just sort of do the same thing we did as tonight. You know, we'll we'll allocate time to each of the agenda items based on you know what we're trying to achieve that night. Okay. Yeah, I I if if that O'Brien item is really kind of a quickie, I think that we could um, probably do this. Okay. So, having said that, I'll entertain a motion to continue the sketch plan hearing. Um, that we're presently reviewing, that would be SD 2110 to May 4th. Anyone want to make that motion? I'll move that we continue SD 2110 uh, to May 4th. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Oh, okay, thank you, Alyssa. Um, Okay, all in, is there any discussion? Um, I would just like to note um, the same thing that I noted for the BlackRock application. There will be opportunity for public comment at the May 4th hearing. We'll make extra special care. Um, we do hate to do this when we don't have time for public comment um, at the regular, at the first meeting. Um, so it just makes us all the more um, respectful and cautious about ensuring that we do that at the next meeting. Um, also, you are unable to attend, or even if you didn't attend tonight, you are absolutely welcome to provide comment in writing. Um, it just needs to be provided before the meeting is concluded. Anything you send to me now, I will share with the board. So please send it to me, um, M-K-E-E-N-E, S-D-U-R-L.com. Otherwise, you'll have the opportunity to speak on May 4th. Thank you, Marla. All right, are we ready to vote? All in favor of continuing this sketch plan application to our May 4th meeting, say aye. 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 Nay. And chair votes aye. So we, Mr. Long and family, we will see you back um, at our May 4th meeting. Thank you very much. We'll look Thank forward you. to it. Thank you. Okay, our next agenda item is sketch plan application SD2111 of Hickory Hillside Limited um, LLC to subdivide an approximately 67.6 acre parcel into three lots of 66.4 acres, lot one, 0.6 acres, lot two, and 0.6 acres, lot three, for the purpose of constructing a single family home on each of lots one, two, and three, and conserving the unbuilt portion of lot one, 47 Chiefs Factory Road. Who is here for the applicant, please? Uh, I'm I'm the uh, civil engineer representing the applicant, Nick Smith from Lamoureux and Dickinson. Thank you. Um, who else is here for the applicant? Nick, is, are you aware that there's anyone else for the applicant? I believe Brandon Bluss is here. He may be muted. Um, Brandon Bluss is representing the applicant as well. Okay. Now, again, this is a He might be one of our mystery callers. I'll see if I can. No, it looks like a lot of mystery callers. There's someone, I, Brandon, uh, who's unmuted. Oh, there he is. Okay. Um, can so you guys hear me okay? This is Brandon. Yep. Hey, okay. Brandon. <laughs> Before we move on to this, um, our third sketch plan for tonight, um, does anyone have any um, disclosures or um, does anyone need to recuse himself? Hearing none, we will so move Jim on. So Jim is now. recused, um, just noting that. Oh, Jim Langan, Langan, right. Yeah, okay. he's already left, but he will continue to be recused on this okay. one. All right. Um, so as you know, you've been very patient tonight. I'm sorry it's so late. Uh, we're really trying to get through. And um, so, so I would ask you to keep your overview fairly brief. It is sketch. Um, so uh, please tell us about your project and what you have in mind. 
Sure, I'll keep it very brief here. Um, this is actually, um, I'll go through the permitting history um, after I give an overall, but the overall parcel here is an approximate uh, 67 acre parcel that's located at the corner of Heinsberg Road and Cheese Factory Road. Um, this is in the SEQ NRP, um, the Southeast Quadrant Natural Resource Protection District. Um, a portion of the project is also located within the floodplain overlay district. Um, the applicant's proposing to uh, subdivide the parcel into three lots, which would be uh, uh, three relatively, well, two, two relatively small lots and a one uh, remaining lot um, that would be used for um, agricultural purposes. Um, and I guess what I would say is that I believe that the board is likely familiar with this project um, in the past. It's gone through sketch plan um, and preliminary subdivision plat approval. Um, we submitted for final subdivision plat approval. My off, our office did um, a couple of months back, but um, due to timing, um, there was no wetland delineation performed, um, which was what held the application up um, as far as uh, getting um, become becoming a full application. So um, we still have not received the wetland delineation. However, we have had multiple uh, wetland experts out on the site. Um, and I think we're fairly confident what the delineation will be. And the intention is that this delineation will be performed um, within the upcoming month here as the growing season really starts to pick up. So um, okay. we'll get Thank the EC involved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I thought this looked familiar. We have seen it before. Um, so there actually is only one staff comment, and that is that staff recommends the board ask the applicant to describe why they are requesting this waiver and provide feedback on whether the applicant should continue to pursue it at the next stage of review. And I believe that is the waiver that puts the properties in a line as opposed to a triangle, correct, Marla? That's correct. Yes. So, um, could you please describe for us why you're requesting this waiver? Sure. I, um, so um, I, we would like to point out that this waiver was previously um, granted in the original or the previous sketch and preliminary plat. Um, the waiver is um, to locate, well, the waiver is to, um, what, what comes from the regulation is that the project structures are supposed to be located within 100 feet from each other, it ends up um, providing either like a triangular effect or a cul-de-sac effect um, to the lots. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing, but um, as far as this site layout is configured, it becomes a little challenging for a number of reasons. Uh, number one is the topography of the site generally. Um, we're, we're looking at, you know, significant fall off the back end of the site. So, um, you know, generally off of Cheese Factory Road, when you're heading south, you're, you're consistently dropping off of the property here. Um, so, so locating a cul-de-sac style um, sometimes becomes a little bit more challenging with that kind of a topography. Um, going with the topography, topography as well and, and soil condition, uh, wastewater systems become a challenge in a, in a situation like that. Um, as you can see, we're identifying three areas that have previously been tested and um, would be approvable wastewater system areas. Uh, so that would be another factor that's played into this. Um, Another item, uh, generally the area to the north of the proposed access road is um, heavily ledge outcrop, um, generally kind of brushy that's barely uh, holding on based on the, <laughs> the existing land configuration there. Um, by putting one of the houses on the other side of the road to try and meet this 100 foot um, area, 100 foot uh, 
buffer there, it would it, it would be kind of challenging, and I think there would be significant impact to um, both trying to hammer out, blast out ledge, raising the raising one of the structures to be you know kind of an ungodly height out of the ground, um, or um, significant wet or vegetation uh, disturbance in that area. Um, and then kind of the last item that factors into this is just generally the reduction to um, impacts on the agricultural field and the agricultural use of the property. So another alternative would be locating this road, lo you know, farther south on the project, trying to, you know, get into the meadow area a little bit more here. The, uh, but I think that ends up kind of um, um, disturbing the contiguous agricultural usable space that's there. So those are kind of the factors that have led us to request this waiver. Thank you, um, Nick. Mm -hmm. um, does, do any board members have any questions or need more clarity or explanation? Or Marla, do you? Um, no, Marla or, or other board members, uh, when the waiver was previously granted, was there a rationale that the board made in doing so on the record somewhere in the findings? I can speak to that if you'd like, because I remember the re I remember the request and I remember at least my thoughts on it. Um, if you're familiar with this area, it's right off um, Heinsberg Road and Cheese Factory. When you turn off Heinsberg and start heading um, west on Cheese Factory, you are there's a bunch of vegetation and sort of like a hill and a rise that um, Nick was describing. And this linear development sort of tucks in behind it. And to do like a cluster development, we did discuss the fact that you would either be pushing the development further out into the meadow and away from being tucked in behind this sort of knoll and vegetation, or you would be impacting the this little cluster of trees and, you know, grading that will essentially hide this linear, you know, three linear houses. That was the discussion and thought process at the time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Okay, I see we're, um, we've worked our way through the one staff comment. So I, um, I would entertain a motion to close sketch hearing. And right on the if I could jump in, oh, sorry, Marla, go ahead. We don't, we don't close, it's a non-binding conversation. Okay. So fail to continue. Conclude. Con conclude the hearing or conclude the- Right, so we're not voting, we're just, if there's okay. no further questions, right. the meeting is ended, we'll see you at preliminary plan. Okay. Uh, I was just going to make a comment, actually. I, I think it's in the staff comments, but just we are requesting that the next meeting be a combined preliminary final, just because this project really gone through a rigorous design already. And I think the applicants so far ahead with the conservation easement and, and, and all these other items that are were required previously. So I, I just hope that the board will be open to that. that that's all. That's really your prerogative, I believe, isn't it, Marla? No, it's actually up to the board, um, but the board usually says do what you like. It's your risk. Okay. Um, but technically, it's up to the board. Does any, do we have to vote on that? No, does there's no one, voting. Would anyone sketch. have a problem with that? There you go. Perfect. Hearing none, I guess you're good to go, Nick. Beautiful, thank you. That's all I was hoping for. <laughs> we'll see you back at uh, uh, preliminary and final plat. Thank you very much. All right, good night. Thank you. Okay, yeah. the next, then I'm sorry, did someone say something? No. The next item, um, the minutes of the March 3rd and March 16th meetings. Um, I think I only read one set of minutes, and that would have been the March 3rd. Maybe I reviewed them both, I don't know, but. Um, do we need to vote on these, Marla? No, uh, we don't need yes. to take a roll call, correct? You don't need to take a roll call. Um, if, so first ask if anyone has any corrections and if there's no corrections, then you can do a voice vote. Okay, 
So let's talk about the March 3rd minutes. Does anyone have any corrections to add? Okay. Um, all in favor of approving the March 3rd minutes? Say aye. 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 Sure, works aye. All um, abstain. Okay, they are approved. Um, all in, does anyone have any corrections uh, for the March 16th um, uh, minutes? Hearing none, um, all in favor of approving the March 16th minutes, say aye. Aye. Sure, votes aye. Any nay or abstentions? Abstain. Okay, thank you. So the minutes are approved. Next agenda item. Don, sorry, um, did you want me to text Jim or are we going to let him off the hook? Um, what do you think, folks? Text Jim, please. Yeah. So while she does that, let me um, read this. South Village Communities LLC has requested reconsideration of decision MS2101, SD2102, and SD2103. Uh, we have a letter in our packet. And um, what are the thoughts? of board members. Does anyone on the board have any questions about the issues identified in the uh, memo or need more information? I guess one thing that um, I, I know what I'd like to hear is the issue of um, they revegetate naturally lots on lot 48X, the area where it's a wetland. It seemed as though that was, unless there's just a miscommunication. Um, we have, we had a graphic before to see it. Oh, yeah. Condition Six. I don't think I have that graphic in the packet. That was just something I sent to the board, but I still okay. have it open, or I can have it open here. So, um, I'm sorry. I know we talked about this earlier. This is the first time I've done a reconsideration. So, Mark has some questions. Um, Marla, please remind me what we need to do. So um, a reconsideration request is not an opportunity to, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, yes you can. Okay. Um, a reconsideration request is not an opportunity to take additional testimony. It's, um, it's the applicant states their request and then the board decides whether to accept it. Um, any sort of additional conversation should be just clarifying the request or um, and basically, the minimum information for the board to decide whether to accept the request and then the testimony on um, what should have been done instead um, would be something that would come at the reopened hearing. So um, the, the way Robin wrote her request letter was exactly right in that it provided the request but didn't provide any sort of supplemental information. And I think Mark's question is also appropriate, which is, can you clarify um, what, what, what thing it is that you thought we misunderstood? Um, so what I'm sharing now, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Yeah, good. Yeah, this is it. Um, this is, so oh, zooming in too much. Let me try again. So this is the plan for SD2102, um, where I've drawn an orange box around lot 48X, um, and then lot 11C, which the applicant has asked, has said they believe is what the condition is supposed to apply to, is where, um, is up here, is this good? 
Okay. So our condition said that lot 48X, which is the orange box, um, to the area south and west of the fence line is to revegetate naturally, which is the wetland area, correct? That sort of T-shaped area. Right, so that condition is modifying. Um, so what I've shown in pink here is the sense that the applicant provided. There's a previous condition, there's another condition that says that the fence should be extended. Oh God, I can't highlight on. The fence should be extended along this portion of the, this portion of the wetland as well. So what this condition that they've requested reconsideration on is referring to is the area of this wetland. So don't we usually encourage or want applicants to leave wetlands um, be wild? Probably not the appropriate expression, but um, why would we have? Hmm. So I think that, you know, Dawn's question is starting to get into the area of additional testimony. Um, and the, you are right to say that it's normal for the board to require wetlands to be left undisturbed. Um, Mark's question is, what did we misunderstand here? So I don't know if Robin wants to speak up and explain what, what it is that we misunderstood. Robin. Yes. Oh, wait, we forgot swearing in. Oh. I'm sorry. Robin, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth under penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you. So what we thought there was a misunderstanding in that all of the area surrounding this little area inside the red circle is going to be agricultural and it will be mowed and cut and used as it is now. So all of the wetland is not gonna revegetate because it's becoming agricultural leasehold. So it would just be the corner inside the, the corner of the orange inside the red <laughs> that would be. So it was just a very small piece as opposed to it just being a recreational area, which is what the area, the orange area is intended to be. Right, so again, I'm gonna jump in and say that a previous condition says that their fence needs to be extended along here as well. We, we thought that the fence only needed to be along where you have it drawn in red. There's a condition modifying that requires the fence to be added to. Right, but we thought that, we interpreted that to mean where you have the red line now. The red line traces what you have shown on this drawing. Right. I'm just tracing something you had already drawn. Thanks. <laughs> then we did not even read it to interpret that way because the leg that you just drew on already has been developed. It was developed back when the water line in the sidewalk was put in. I'm at a loss. Marla, I'm gonna need your help with this. I think that makes sense. Um, so I think, Mark, does that sort of answer your question? We didn't think that they were protecting that Southern part of the wetland at all. Right, and it sounds like they're not because it's already been developed to put in the sidewalk and the water line. Well, you can see where the sidewalk and water line are on this plan. And then the rec path is intended to go on the top. See where it goes all alongside. Uh, draw. Wait, now try. Can I draw? Can you can this? see it there. Can I draw? I just gave you permission. Yeah. You should see a paintbrush over by there. So, tools. Hmm. I, I'm trying. Sorry. Yep. Choose my pen color. <laughs> okay. So, this is. It's not working. Hmm. It might just be a little pokey. It's pokey. Yeah, our connections have been slow today. 
Yep, it says. Oh, I know why it's not working. No, no, it was me. It's me. Okay, go ahead. So this is the. Yeah. Do I need to get my pen again? Sure. Yeah. All right. Yay! I'm not very good at presenting. This is Delilah's job. Um, so this is the. There we go. Mm -hmm. This is the path. So all the infrastructure for it is under there. I should have used a fat pen. Um, does that make any sense? Because the easement for the path is way out here. So we perceived that this was going to stay the way it always has been, and that this area inside here was what you wanted to preserve, but we thought it wasn't understood that all of this area out here is going to be farmland and cut the way it is now being cut. Am I making any sense? I'm totally so, lost. I'm really what sorry. Is, what is that sort of T-shaped whale tail type of shape of wetlands that's Here. just north of the, the sidewalk water line? Right. This is, this is not a wetland. This disconnects up here, and this is an old farm ditch. Okay. So and you and you can see it. It's literally a ditch. So where does that leave us, Marla and Mark? So that's um, one question. And then um, did you guys have another question about the it, was Jim able to rejoin us? I know he texted me back, but I didn't get the ch chance to see what he said. Jim's back on. Jim's back on. I'm here. Um, did you have a question on the inclusionary versus affordable um, request? We did. You I, I was just, uh, I guess, interested to hear um, about the, the sort of the, the, the impact, I guess, Robin, <laughs> of the Changing, you know, changing uh, inclusionary to a, to affordable um, in the decision. What um, what um, impact or what your just hear a little more about your concerns about that word change? The concerns are that the LDRs address inclusionary under one set of rules, and they in they discuss affordable units under bonus conditions at another set of rules and all the applications fall under one set of rules or the other set of rules, and we belong under the affordable set of rules and not the inclusionary set of rules. Okay. Marla, your thoughts or other board, member, board members' thoughts? Jim? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd like for us to, I mean, I, I'm leaning towards getting the language right. Um, I don't know. If, um, so if, if we really meant affordable, we should say so. Can I ask? All right, let me ask a question. I guess this is more of Marla. Um, is affordable and inclusionary been differentiated recently in the regulations? Somewhat more, well, more recently than the South Village Project Master Plan, um, relatively recently. The I think the important thing here is that the condition that uses the word affordable inclusionary instead of affordable is pertaining to the section of the affordable housing regulations that cross-reference you have to do. It says you have to do the reporting that is required for inclusionary. Um, so that condition says, references the inclusionary housing. So though, though I think that 
Robin's correct that it was potentially an error to say the word inclusionary because it's a cross reference section. I'm not sure that it makes any difference. We, I think it makes a difference because all the LDRs under section 18.02 regarding the affordable density bonus only talk about affordable. I do agree with you that when you get down there, it does circle back to particular conditions of the inclusionary zoning ordinance of 18.01, but it does not, it's very specific about the affordable density bonus and affordable units being different and not all the same things apply. So while you're here and while I'm here, and we know what you meant, um, God forbid we should get hit by buses or anything, but if somebody else had to interpret this and neither one of us was here to explain it, we feel it could be very muddled when the LDRs actually make it very clear. So we're, I think maybe it's just a typo and we're just asking for it to be corrected. Marla? So um, I think that unless the board has other questions on other aspects of it, I think that's as deep into the discussion as we should go at this time. Um, so the All board right. should take a vote on whether yeah. To accept the reconsideration request. Um, actually, why don't we do a sort of a temperature of the board about whether we're inclined to accept the reconsideration request? Um, or maybe it's better to just say, let me just ask this question. Does the board feel that any of the other elements of the reconsideration request have merit? If we are to consider, re or if we are to take a vote, the alternative is, we take a vote on consideration of just those two items that we talked about tonight. It doesn't sound to me like there are other issues. Um, so limiting limiting it to two, those two issues makes sense to me. Okay, so by doing that, the board is effectively sending the message that no, we don't think the other changes are warranted. Well, yes. So there's three items. It's two issues with three items, correct? Yes, right. It's condition number six, condition 26, and condition 22 that we're talking about reopening for reconsideration. There's the issue about um, also, which I believe was just a typo, about the number of, of affordable units in the master plan amendment because the way the notes were written, it looks like we're dropped a colossal number of affordable units when the fact we only dropped very few because it's a direct percentage of the total number of units. Um, again, I don't think it's a big change. It's just a typo, but we would like it, the record set straight. Marla, I need some guidance on procedure here. Um, so, unless the board would like to take up the comment that Robin just made, again, again, keeping in mind, um, you know, we have talked about, um, we have looked at it and we, um, you know, unless you have additional questions, we don't need to, we can't take a testimony at this time. Um, does anyone want to take up? to the potential list for voting the condition that Robin just referenced. Okay, so um, I think we should have a motion to amend condition number six and 26, no, condition to reopen, the a motion to reopen SD 2102 for the purposes of reconsidering condition number six and condition number 26. Um, and we'll do, and then we'll do a motion to reopen SD 2103 for the purposes of reconsidering condition number 22. And we'll do them as two separate motions? You can do them together. I just that felt like a lot to say. All right. Um, I'll make a motion that we reopen SD 2102 uh, for reconsideration for condition number six 
in condition number 26, and we reopen SD 2103 uh, for reconsideration for condition number 22. Bless you, Mark. I will second that. Can the chair second? Yes. So all okay. in favor. Pardon, all, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. The motion is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Thanks for working so late into the night, you guys. Holy mackerel. <laughs> okay. Is there any other business? I should have asked that before, I guess, but any other business or can we adjourn? We make a motion that we adjourn. Okay. Do we need to vote on that? Please don't vote on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Get Tonight some sleep. that we adjourn. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Don. Good night.